Hey everyone, how's it going? Matthew Kadish here, author, evil genius, and holy warrior, coming at you today with a very special interview with a good friend of mine who is a talented writer in and of himself. And we're going to be talking about what some of you might think is a little known uh, TV show called S Sleeper Cell. And uh, it was a, a show that I watched about 15 years ago when it first aired on Showtime. And I was really struck at how good it was. And I was very sad that it didn't make it past two seasons. And uh, imagine my surprise when I, I meet the gentleman that I'm about to introduce you to. And he actually worked on the show. He was a writer and a producer on it. And he's actually worked on some of my favorite TV shows over the, the course of a couple of years. And uh, I'm really excited to get to introduce him to you and talk to him about uh, the craft of writing thrillers, political thrillers, uh, terrorism thrillers, stuff like that. And he's got a really unique perspective, which I'm really excited to get to, to you know, question him about. So everyone uh, say hello to Cameron Pasha. Did I pronounce that right, Pasha? You, you did that, and I'm excited to be on the show. Thank you for having me on. Okay, so Cameron, um, basically, uh, I'm, I asked you here today so we could talk about one of the, actually, it was the first show that you ever worked on. It was called Sleeper Cell. It was actually the second. I my my breakthrough show, the, just breaking into the industry, was I was a staff writer on the Twilight Zone on UPN with Forrest Whitaker. Okay. Uh, but yeah, and and then uh, that show lasted a season. Then I was pretty much out of work for a couple of years, and then uh, in two thousand and five, I was invited on the Sleeper Cell. Okay, so um, one of the things that I found really interesting about Sleeper Cell, and this was a, a mini series on Showtime that originally aired back in two thousand and five, mm -hmm. and it was uh, kind of the brainchild of these two guys, Ethan. Yeah. Reef or Raff? Ethan Reef and Cyrus Forrest. Okay, Ethan Reef and Cyrus Forrest. And uh, these are the guys, uh, they had made a really bad Chow Yun Fat movie called Bulletproof Monk. And uh, I can remember when I was going through film school, I was like a big Chow Yun Fat fan because I, I, I worshiped at the altar of John Wayne. Were, they were very proud of that film. So I, 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 won't, I won't say it's a bad movie. <laughs> well, I, I mean, like, I, I remember when it came out, I was really excited to see it because, of course, Chow Yun Fat. And it had some great ideas to it, but there, there was something lost in the translation uh, between script and screen where it just, it wasn't as cool as it should have been in my opinion, but it was a valiant effort on their part. But then um, these guys uh, made, you know, Sleeper Cell and it was it was a, a amazing show for, you know, the time. And then they went on to make Kung Fu Panda. So like, you know, they, they definitely have like a lot of talent between the two oh, of them. Yeah. And, and they also, they, they wrote, they, they sold the original version of the of the Robin Hood movie that, that ultimately yeah. Ridley Scott made. And they, they that was a spec script they wrote and right after Sleeper Cell. So they've had a good career. And who, who can forget uh, Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight? So, <laughs> so these, these guys, they, they have a very checkered uh, kind of filmography, but uh, every one of their movies has like really good elements to it. And one of the things that really struck me, because you know I didn't know you 15 years ago on the show, I didn't know who these guys were or anything like that. And um, it was a show that came out like four years after the events of 9-11. Yeah. And um, I can remember there was some controversy surrounding it because it was a show that was kind of willing to show a, a sympathetic side of Islam in addition to like, I mean, like at the time, like nobody really knew a whole lot about Islamic terrorism. Like it was something that was kind of thrust onto us from the attack and, you know, mm -hmm. the war that followed in Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And there, there was a lot of like prejudice and, and misconception mm -hmm. about you know, Muslims, or is it pronounced Muslims or Muslims? Well, I mean, in America, we generally train Muslims. Uh, the actual way we Muslims say is Muslim, so, but it's never said that way in America, so I'll go with either. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to be accurate and, and say Muslim. So, like, there's a lot of prejudice and, and ignorance and just, like, kind of um, people who, like, just weren't exposed to the, the Muslim religion, Islam, and, and didn't really know about the culture and, you know, the, the traditions and stuff like that. And all we knew was really just like the bad stuff that was coming to us, like the radical stuff and the, the attacks and these people who like kill innocent civilians and women yeah. and children and stuff like that. And so, you know, especially around this time when, you know, the war in Iraq was going on, uh, I can remember like, it was like, people were just like, yeah, you know, like, like, Take take the fight to them, like you know, no sympathy, no no quarter. And uh, this was kind of one of the first shows that kind of came out and said, like, okay, we're going to acknowledge that you know we're fighting against radicals here, but we also want to show the mm -hmm. other side of the story, the, the mainstream side. I mean, I mean, if, if the religion is almost two billion people, if we were, if we were all those guys, the planet would be over. <laughs> yeah, but but even if one percent of us were those guys, the planet would be over. So yeah. But Hollywood around this time, they were, I think, they were trying to figure out how exactly to portray. 
like mm-hmm. Islam, because like for the longest time, like the Russians were the bad guys, right? It was just like you either had Nazis or you had Russians. And it was like, very easy to make those guys the the villains, but with uh, with Muslims and Islam, uh, it it was kind of like a weird balancing act that people had to walk because you know you wanted to have you wanted to show how evil some of these people were, but you also didn't want to vilify everyone that was involved in, in the religion. Well, well, uh, that is the interesting thing you read the Razor Matt is is is. Uh, is how Hollywood was interested in portrayal. I mean, I'll very quickly, I'll tell you the history of Hollywood portrayal of Muslims was actually it was this kind of thread. The initial versions of it back in the like in the silent films to, to into into the sixties was Muslims were magical. It was Aladdin and Alibaba and Sinbad, right? It was Arabian night stuff, or, or we were sensual, like you know Rudolph Valentino and the Sheik, right? That kind of stuff, right? And so but we we weren't necessarily villains for that period of time in Hollywood. We were part of Hollywood's imagery, but it was all very fantasized or eroticized, right? But it wasn't negative. Uh, and then it was really when it became sort of the Muslim terrorist was was coming out full view. And that's actually really started in the 70s when you had people, you know, hijacking airplanes and stuff like that and then accelerated the 80s with the Iranian revolution. But it was really after September 11th that it became sort of this powerful narrative. And, you know, our major competitor show of Supercell was 24, which preceded us, actually came, it premiered the two days after September 11th. And for several seasons, there were Muslim villains on that show, right? I think they evolved eventually, I think in part because of pressure from Supercell, you know, in their characterization. That's really a bit of the journey historically about, about how Muslims were being portrayed when the show started. Yeah, I, I think I remember my first exposure yeah. to the idea yeah. of, of Muslim terrorists as, as the villains was in True Lies, the Schwarzenegger well, yeah. movie. And that, that was kind of like, there was this debate after the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and Russia kind of like, you know, um, going into a, a republic uh, mm-hmm. that uh, like Hollywood was like, well, we can't use the Russians anymore because they're no longer the bad guys. So like, who, who do we find? And True Lies was kind of the first one to kind of point the, the arrow at the-, yeah. at the and, and, and that was, that was, you know, look, it did because it was a very entertaining movie. Objectively, it's an entertaining movie. But, you know, look, I'm sitting in the audience there uh, and watching this as a young man and it hurt it hurt me because you know you're you're seeing this mass of of uh, people that are being allegedly connected to your religion, right? And, and your hero Arnold Schwarzenegger is taking them down. It, it, it's hurtful. Yeah. So, but, yeah, but uh, it is what it is. But getting back to Sleeper mm-hmm. Cell, like that was one of the the interesting aspects of the show, at least to me, when I first started watching it, was that there was this real dichotomy there where it was like, oh, it's not so cut and dry. There are these shades of gray, and there. It's not just like this is an evil religion. This is mm-hmm. uh, this is a fringe aspect of it that just happens to be at the forefront of everything. And and the, the really interesting thing to me was that like you know the, like the main character, his whole kind of like motivation, his whole arc is about like he's a true holy warrior because he's doing what he does to like save his religion from these extremists. And I thought that was a really interesting kind of. Um, uh, take on on the material, and it was something that like no one was really doing around that time. Yeah, and it was revolution; it had never been done before. In fact, when I moved to LA in two thousand and one to become a screenwriter, I had hoped to myself develop a show with the Muslim hero fighting the terrorists. And ultimately, I ended up not being the one that developed it; but I ended up being the one hired onto it. And so, it, it, the moment of history happened then. Yeah. Do you know what uh, what um, R- Rife and Voris's kind of you know, inspiration was for a show like this? Did they ever tell you, like... Yeah, I mean, we talked about it in the rule. I mean, I can only share with you what they shared with me there. I'm sure there are many layers of it. What I remember them saying in, in the writer's room was that I think the initial idea had come right after September 11th. And remember, there, there was, there was like, a telethon to raise money for the victims and, and the firefighters and all of that. And they were watching it, uh, as, you know, pretty much most of America was watching it that night. And, and they were, there was this moment where Muhammad Ali came out on the stage. Muhammad Ali came out and he's a Muslim, and he was most Americans sort of forget. You know, this guy's a this guy converted to Islam, you know, and and this was a big thing. Change his name and all that. And he's a hero to most people in America and the world. And he actually came out and said, he literally said, as he got up on the stage, as as Ethan and Cyrus with me, he said to the America was watching. He's like, you know me, you know my character. Please don't put what happened onto people of my religion, right? And that really struck them. That Muhammad Ali said that, uh, you know, and he said made them go, you know, there are so many Muslims out there who are the norm, like Muhammad Ali is a, is a great example of the norm, but and like, why are we never being seen or hearing their perspective in, in media? And so from what they told me, they, that started the wheels turning of 
why, and especially because they ended up having an African American male. It wasn't a Pakistani or an Arab male who was the FBI agent. There are actually Arab American and Pakistani American FBI agents. Uh, they're also African American Muslim FBI agents. And so, but they chose that. I think they were inspired by that moment by Muhammad Ali, and they wanted to actually do an African American, uh, you know, played wonderfully by Michael Ely, our, our lead, uh, because here's an example: somebody who is Amer just like Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali can trace his ancestry back you know, 400 years to pre-colonial America, right? You know, as when his ancestors came over as slaves, right? And so here, that is the idea that Islam is a foreign religion would have been centered if it had been like a Pakistani immigrant like myself. But here they brought an African-American who's who would come from a long heritage. His father had converted to Islam, was part of the storyline, so. Yeah, and, and it was part of his character. I, I remember there's a scene and it was an episode that you wrote in season two where, you know, one of the the terrorists. It's like, like, how can you work for the Americans? And and uh, Darwin's reply is that, motherfucker, I am an American. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, well, he said it a little bit more politely than I did, uh, but uh, it was just a. Uh, uh, he's a, he's a very interesting character. I can't wait to talk about him. But yeah. you know, one of the one of the kind of historical contexts of this show is that back in two thousand five, this was kind of like. Um, just at the dawn of the paid cablers getting into TV production, like uh, HBO had started doing their original series and they were getting a lot of critical acclaim because unlike the the networks, HBO was free to do whatever the, the heck they wanted uh, with their, their shows. They could show nudity, they could curse, they could do all this stuff that you couldn't do on broadcast TV. And once HBO kind of took off, the other paid cable channels were kind of like, hey, maybe we should you know follow suit. And so Showtime was kind of getting into the original series uh, game around this time, and Sleeper Cell was one of their firsts, even though it was considered to be a, a mini series as opposed to like an actual. Well, well, let me address that because when I was hired on the show, it was planned to be a, a series where every episode would appear once a week, right? That mm -hmm. was the plan. It was, to my knowledge, uh, it was a strategic decision much later in the process. Uh, I think even after we the show was in the can, we had filmed some episodes, I think they had made a decision internally that it's better to present this as a mini series and put it out all over the course of 10 days. Uh, and uh, I think partly because they thought it would have the most impact and get the biggest audience. And partly I'm sure there may have been some considerations of awards attention because if there was if there was a chance to get Sleeper Cell into a, into a smaller category where it might shine. And I, I think both of those worked. Yeah, and, and they kind of, um, it was released in December of 2005. So it was like right at the end of the year and they kind of slid in their right before the cutoff for award season. Uh, but, but it was kind of an odd choice to do like the, like instead of the week to week release, it was like, you know, uh, one episode per day for like 10 right. days straight. And uh, I, I mean, like, I, I was like, oh, I should set my watch. So I, I don't miss these episodes when it was airing. Um, but this was kind of like around the time where um, I, I know Dexter was kind of in the pipeline and they were really hyping up Dexter. And it was through Sleeper Cell that I saw the promo like commercials for Dexter and stuff like that. And um, so uh, it, it was right when Showtime was kind of ramping up its its kind of foray in, into original series. And so I think it might have flown under a lot of people's radars because not not everyone was watching Showtime for original series back then. And, um, and, and it, I mean, it got, it got the network a certain kind of new attention and a certain kind of sophistication because the show engendered a lot of discussion. I mean, the New York Times did pieces on it, the LA Times. I have a huge frame thing of the LA Times did a full page uh, article on the show in which I was heavily featured. And, you know, it's uh, it got them the attention to put them on the map in a, in a new way. And uh, it's kind of interesting looking at Showtime right now because, you know, if you look at a show like Homeland, which mm -hmm. premiered about six years after you yeah. guys did, um, it's basically the same show, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, told, told, told it from a different point of view, but I, I mean, like in terms of like the, the tension and like, you know, how they deal with all these like political elements that are going on in the world in a timely fashion. Uh, you guys were almost like a precursor to a show like Homeland. It was, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I, I will only say this, you know, uh, which is an unfortunate reality. You know, Homeland was on for many years. It was a successful show. You know, they never wanted me on it. You know, I'm, I mean, they were pretty straight about it. They, you know, I, I had helped the show Sleeper Cell get Golden Globe and Emmy nominations, but they didn't want a Muslim staff. They didn't. They had their own reasons for that. And you know, I don't know if you know about that. They actually got embarrassed by that. You know, for the, their own political reasons, they didn't want any Muslims on staff because they felt that we would somehow limit the narrative they wanted to tell. And you know, that's Hollywood. And there was this incident which really embarrassed them because of that. Where uh, because many years into the show, I think maybe five years into the show, 
um, they had done an episode where it was set in Beirut. Of course, we don't film in the back lot here in LA, but he was set in Beirut, and they wanted to make the the the, the walls of this lot look like you know Beirut graffiti, political graffiti. So he hired an Arab artist group to come in and do the graffiti. And this Arab artist group had heard that Homeland didn't have any Arabs or Muslims on the staff or in the crew or anyone else. And this was a matter, a lot of grumbling amongst Muslims in the film industry. Like, why don't these guys want us involved in this show that's getting so much attention? And so they came in and they did the graffiti and the graffiti was Homeland in Arabic, Homeland is racist, Homeland is Islamophobic, <laughs> and it was put on there and it was filmed. And, and, that, and that, the night that that episode premiered, the, the artist group put out a press release saying, because you don't have anyone of this religion or culture anywhere on this 500 person crew, you couldn't correct that. And it was really embarrassing for them. So you'd have to ask them what their agenda was on that. And I've never been able to get an answer. And I think I know as a result what the answer is. Well, it's interesting because when I worked at Paramount Studios, mm -hmm. uh, Star Trek had kind of the, the same philosophy for Star Trek fans mm -hmm. working on on uh, staff where like they were like, we don't want anyone who likes Star Trek working. Yeah, that's it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Star Wars is right like, like that right now as well. But, that's yeah, right. but, but I think um, I think Brandon Braga, I, I remember when I when I was on the, yeah. the set, I would hear, you know, rumors about how like, you know, he really hated talking to Star Trek fans because they'd always call him out on his bad story decisions. Yeah. And so like, he just didn't want that in the writer's room. Like he just wanted to be able to do what he wanted. And, 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 and I think there's an element of that. I absolutely think there's an element of that. I think there's also political elements, you know, whether it's me there now, there's, there's quite a few Muslim writers. When I arrived, there's almost none. And, you know, none of them being there, you know, part of me, you just, you just don't want your politics challenged as well, which I will credit Ethan Reef and Cyrus Morris for. You know, they, they didn't share my politics. They themselves differ on politics, but they didn't share mine, and they never censored me, which is a blessing. They let me speak up, even if they didn't like what I had to say. And you know what is interesting about Sleeper Cell, having like rewatched both seasons recently, um, is that you know, even though like there are political elements in the show, it doesn't feel political to me. Yeah, it's not a propaganda show. Yeah, it, it really isn't. Like it, it doesn't push like like, oh, all Muslims are good, or all Muslims are evil, or the Americans are, are the bad guys, or like, you know, it, it's our fault 9-11 happened. Yeah. Like, th it's really good at showing kind of like a spectrum of different beliefs through the prism of the characters. Because that's reality. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, there are all these characters, that, in, even in the real world, when people are fighting terrorists, they have a broad range of perspectives on everything. And yeah, they have different perspectives, you know. They don't they, they don't agree on things. So yeah. But but it never preached to me, and I, I think that's the the sign of a quality show in, in the sense that the writers uh, of of a good you know show can kind of present a, a variety of ideas without having to settle on and say like this is right, this is wrong, and if you don't agree with that, you're bad, and alienate their audience that way. And, and it was just kind of an interesting thing that I noticed on my rewatch, yeah. where I was like, you know what, like. This could have very easily been like a very propaganda -ish show, and it and it really wasn't. Absolutely, and you know that that's why I was very honored and, and proud to be part of the show because you know aside I was able to speak and I was able to get my points of view across, uh, and I was able to get them into the scripts, uh, even if the, it sometimes made the show on us uncomfortable if the character said certain things, but they let them do it because I said that's what the character believes. You don't have to like it, right? Uh, and so that that is some of the best storytelling I've ever been involved in, uh, and you know. I'm sorry that it is not as common as it should be. Well, um, speaking of that, now that we've kind of covered the the groundwork for what Sleeper Cell was, yeah. uh, I want to I want to give you a chance to kind of tell people like who you are and what your background is. We touched on it a little bit, but one of the things that really struck me, and um, you know, it's it's funny because like I met you because you just started commenting on my tweets on. Right. Twitter. I, was just, I was just a follower of your tweets, commenting about a lot of Star Wars stuff, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. and and, um, and then uh, eventually, like you revealed, like oh, I worked on Sleeper Cell and Nikita and and Kings, and I, I was like, oh my god, I love those shows, and uh, and so like I, I was like I was like I gotta follow this guy back, and then like we just kind of started chatting, yeah. and and you know, as if those shows weren't proof enough to me that you had. A great deal of talent as a writer. You're also a novelist, yeah. and you've written two books. One is called Mother of Believers, and the other is called Shadow of Swords. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you know, I'm a novelist as well. You know, I've written, Absolutely. you know, Earthman Jack and yeah. a couple other science fiction things. Congratulations! And, you've got another one out recently. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, trying to put out, you know, books on a regular basis. But you, you know, I worked as a screenwriter in Hollywood for a while mm -hmm. as well, and so like I kind of know what goes into both. And to me, you can always tell who like a quote unquote serious writer is mm -hmm. based off of the fact that they're able to write 
not just screenplays, but novels. Yeah, and as you, as you know, as you yourself know, they are different formats. A lot of people can't yeah. translate those two formats. But it's a, such a different skill set of, yeah. of writing goes into re- crafting a novel. Absolutely. And it, it's almost like the difference between playing T-ball and playing in the major leagues, you know, because uh, novels, you know, they, they're they very intensive in terms of like how you write them, how you structure them, how you craft them. And you really get a sense of who the writer is from a novel because that it's just them. Occasionally they may write with a partner or whatever, but like when it comes to screenplays, you have like a lot of collaboration going on. You have a lot of people forcing ideas in and changing things. And so when you watch a, a movie or a TV show, that's not always a good barometer of how talented a writer is because you don't know what you know contributions yeah, yeah. I, I have scripts that premiered that have not one word that I wrote on them, but they have my name on them. I've had a couple episodes where I'm like, oh my God, I, I wish I wasn't associated with the final version of the script. But it is what it is. I mean, the people are out there, right? And those are always the ones that somebody on Twitter says, you wrote that garbage script. I'm like, I actually did write that garbage script, but with the, that my name's on it. <laughs> yeah, you got paid. Uh, but the point I was trying to make is that, you know, I always have a lot more respect for writers who are also novelists. Um, simply because I know the, the level of skill it takes to write a novel as compared to a screenplay. Like I could knock out a screenplay, you know, 120 pages, double spaced screenplay format in like a week. Whereas like with a novel, like like it takes me years to write some of my novels. Um, it, it's well, very so difficult. We, we, you know, to talk a little bit about the craft and the difference of those for anyone's interested. This is, I actually have my own methodology that this just works for me and may be very different from how you do your novels. Uh, I actually, both of my novels have been published and I've just written my third one. I write them as screenplays first. I actually write a full movie length screenplay of the novel first. And then what I do is every scene of the screenplay, I turn it to a chapter. So I've already got the, the essential story moment of, the, of that chapter and the basic dialogue. And then I create all the prose around it, right? That's, that's my methodology. I don't know if anyone else has ever done it, but the nice thing that I get from people that are fans of my books is they like, oh, this reads like a movie. I just can't put this down. I mean, I mean, one of my novels, Mother of Believe, is 600 pages long, but it started off as a small script, right? And it's just like, but it moves really, really fast, even though it's a 600 page novel. Yeah, and you know, every writer has their own process. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have uh, a bevy of screenplays that I wrote unproduced uh, while I was in LA, and they're just waiting for me to turn them into novels <laughs> right now when I, have the time, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about your novels and and what your background in writing is and how you got into like TV? Sure. So you know, you know, I was actually born in Pakistan and I immigrated to the United States when I was three years old. Uh, you know, so back when Joe Ford was president, and uh, and so I, I grew up in New York City in Brooklyn, and uh, I worked actually as a journalist for a while in New York, and then I went back to get my law degree and my MBA. So I got a JD and MBA, I got all these degrees. And I was bored out of my mind in these business calls. What, what am I doing here? And I was like, why am I doing this with my life? And in, it was actually in this business school accounting class that I just, out of boredom, I started writing my first script. I wrote a teen horror movie. And it was, it was just, I Scream was popular at the time. I really liked Scream. So it was like that kind of thing. Like, the, you know. Kevin Williamson, yeah. Yeah, and the, the pretty girl runs up the stairs with a guy with a mask and knife chasing her, right? That was the kind of script I wrote. And I graduated, I was working as a lawyer in New York, and I said, again, bored, I wasn't happy. I sent that script out with no connections. I didn't know anybody, Pox Sunday dude in, in New York. I just sent the script out unsolicited to agents and got mostly rejection letters. One smaller agent read it and go, this, you've got some talent here, he decided to represent me, and then I made my first professional sale uh, to Paramount through him. And that's like, well, I can do this? And so I was like, oh my God, I can, I can make money writing screenplays. And so I quit my job as a lawyer and moved to LA in uh, 2001. And I've been writing professionally uh, since then. And so that's my general background, uh, my novels. And you know, I'll, I will be cheesy enough to show them because I love them so much. And as you know, as you yourself know as a novelist, our novels are our children, so we like to show them off, right? Uh, yep. So it's my little babies. So this, this is my first novel that was published. It's uh, Mother of the Believers, which is a historical epic novel about uh, the birth of Islam from the point of view of Prophet Muhammad's wife, Aisha. And you know, the reason I did that novel is that, you know, as you know, one of the standard critiques of Islam is, oh, it's a misogynistic religion and you oppress your women, right? And so I wanted to tell the story from the point of view of the Prophet's own wife, who even by modern 21st century standards was a feminist. I mean, she was this remarkable woman. She was a scholar. She was a, uh, a political leader. And she was actually a general. She led military armies, right? And so she's not your image of what you think a Muslim woman is. And I wanted to tell the story from her point of view to really shake up that foundation of people's perceptions. So that's one. And the second book I have, which was published, uh, they're both published with Simon & Schuster. Uh, this one is uh, Shadow of the Swords, 
which is a novel on the Crusades, on specifically on the Third Crusade between Richard the Lionheart and Saladin, the Muslim king that he fought for Jerusalem. And so it's it's really this epic story of these two civilizations clashing. And I was inspired by September 11th because the reason I wrote it, it's, the the Shadow of the Swords is actually one of the very scripts, the first screenplays I wrote right after September 11th because I wanted to talk about you know the enemy isn't Islam, the enemy isn't the enemy is fanaticism. And I wanted to turn, turn the world upside down a thousand years before when you had, you know, Muslims were the dominant world civilization and were considered the high culture of the time. And then you had these European crusaders coming in who were, you know, who were cannibals and, and killing women left and right. And, and, you know, they were barbarians by the standards of their own time. They were considered really lowly people and very dangerous. And so I wanted to show how fear and religious fanaticism isn't about one religion. It's about something within the human spirit that needs to be overcome. And so both those novels were published and they've done well. Oh, that's fantastic. So we talked about your novels and we talked about your early days. How did you come to get involved in Sleeper Cell? Like, how did you, how were you hired? What was your involvement or position uh, on the staff? And uh, what kind of contributions did you make to the show? Yeah. Well, you know, right after I moved, I moved to LA in April 2001. And as you know, you, you know, you got to have writing samples to try to get attention, right? And so, you know, I, I had sold a couple of sci-fi things to Paramount, but I really wanted, I was a Lord just come out of being a lawyer and I said you know I really wanted to get on a show like Law and Order uh, or, you know and so I wrote a legal spec right I wrote a legal script which got me a lot of attention because this is in April 2001 and it's essentially it was it, it ended up being very prescient it was about what would happen to our uh, to our civil liberties you know uh, if you had a Muslim terror attack right <laughs> and so it was from a, a lawyer's kind of point of view of, of, of some of having to defend somebody who you know it, it, the legal structure now prevented you from actually having the evidence you needed because I was sort of foreseeing what was coming and you know, I didn't really foresee it. And that script got me a lot of attention, got me a lot of meetings. They even got me meetings on like Law and Order. And then September 11th happens. And so suddenly that my agents don't want to send that script out anymore, right? It's too visceral. It's too close to home. And so that script just was shelved for several years. And then Sleeper Cell got greenlit by Showtime. They did the pilot. They liked the pilot. They greenlit the show and they were starting to put together a writing staff. And so my agent said, wait, did Cameron have a, a legal thing about a Muslim guy? And a, so they sent them the script, and the guys really liked it. They brought me in, and I said, you know, well, I'm a practicing Muslim. They're like, wait, what? They had never really met a practicing Muslim in Hollywood, right? You know, and they were quite startled. And, and, uh, and then I, I, I shared with them my thoughts on the pilot. I thought it was a good pilot. I had some minor critiques that were very specific. I was like, actually, we Muslims wouldn't do it this way. We would have done it that way. And these are little things. Uh, like, I mean, I'll give you an example. There's a scene in the pilot where the, the hero, Darwin, who's the FBI undercover agent, is talking to one of the terrorists in the bathroom, right? And they're actually standing in the, in the, in the stalls next to each other talking. I said, you know, practically Muslims don't like to pee standing up. You know, it's actually, a, a, there's an old tradition of the prophet that you should, you know, that it's unclean to pee standing up for men, and you should actually sit on the equivalent of a toilet, right? Or you should... And so I said, that scene wouldn't have been accurate. But how would anyone know? You can research a religion up and down, but how would you know how people are peeing in the bathroom? That's not something that you're going to find in a book on Islam. It's something you live the culture with, right? And so when I made that critique, they're like, wow. You've, you know, you might actually be of value on our show. You'll bring an authenticity that we never thought about, that no one would even think about on that level. And so they hired me, and, and, uh, and the journey began. And I was there for two years. You, you know, it, it strikes me as funny that um – People in Hollywood don't always, because you always think like, oh, they're going to hire consultants to come in and kind of inform them on stuff that they might not, you know, be aware of. Yeah. You know, like if you're writing a legal thriller, you have a lawyer on hand that you can like ask legal questions of or something like that. Uh, did it never occur to these guys to hire a Muslim, a Muslim to come in and consult with them? Well, I mean, it's not even an occurrence. I mean, at the time, this is 2005, and even then, I was pretty much the only guy in town, right? Or at least, and the only one who identified as a Muslim. There was, I mean, as you know, working living in LA, there's a lot of uh, delightful Iranian people here whose family fled the revolution are like, yeah, my grandfather was Muslim. I don't want to talk about it, right? A lot of Persians. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, yeah I, don't want, I don't want to be associated with this Islam thing, whatever, okay? I was open practicing Muslim who prayed, fasted, all that stuff, right? And I was not hiding it, right? And so there weren't, there really, at the time, there weren't, there wasn't really anybody that they could find like that. They actually, uh, someone who still remains a close friend of mine today, they hired uh, an Arab American actor who, uh, who was very good at giving them uh, you know, uh, Arabic train for the actors so they could speak Arabic properly and, and did that. So, you know, they did what they could with what they knew existed. When they met me, they're like, okay, well, we didn't know you existed, but now that we do, we'd like you on board. Which again, it turned out they were actually the exception because later on, after that show, 
along with Homeland, there's been a dozen other shows that even if it's not the entire show, they're large arcs of the Muslim terrorist guy, right? There's been a bunch of those in the last 15 years, and not one of them will ever want to meet me. I get other work. I get a lot of other interesting work, but they just don't want me on those shows. So Sleeper Cell was the only one that actually wanted authentic you know, Muslim voices to this day. And I think you can tell when you're watching the show because like it – it feels very authentic, um, especially from Darwin's point of view, because th th there are a lot of moments in the show where you have these philosophical debates uh, between the characters about what Islam truly is. Yeah. And uh, uh, it, it's kind of educational and it really kind of gives uh, someone like me who doesn't have a whole lot of ex experience with Islam. You know, I'm a, I'm a Roman Catholic boy, born and raised, um, but like, you know, like learning different aspects of it through this show was, I thought it was probably one of the most interesting aspects of it. So uh, I, I really appreciated the authenticity that it brought, e even in the pilot episode, which I know you weren't involved with, you know, there's a, there's a scene where uh, Darwin, uh, the main character, the undercover FBI agent, he gets into a fight on the subway with, uh, it looks like Jesse Pinkman. I couldn't tell if it was. <laughs> oh, that was it. They were attacking some poor seat guy, like these racist yeah. attacking seat guy for a turban. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he he not only kicked their asses, but he schooled them on the yeah. differences between yeah. Sunni and Shia uh, yeah. while he was doing it. Yeah, he said, "Yeah, these guys aren't Muslim, and you're hassling them." Yeah, and because they, as a historically, what was happening after September 11, Sikhs were attacked because we Muslims mostly don't wear turbans. Yeah. Certainly not in America, but Sikhs as part of the religion tend to wear turbans, and so they were unfortunately got the brunt of a lot of bigotry. Yeah, but Darwin's just like you, dumb motherfuckers, and then they start starts like laying down the law on. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, if you really want to be racist, this is how you do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but it was little aspects like that peppered throughout the show that I, I just found like, like it, it just added something to it that you weren't getting from something like uh, like 24, for instance. Well, you know? well, you know, I was actually, you probably saw the episode that I that I wrote, episode four of season one, which is about the religious scholar. And it's about a, ba yeah. it, it's a religious scholar who's deprograms terrorists and how the, the, the cell sees him as a threat to their agenda and they want him killed, right? So I wrote that episode and that episode was submitted by uh, Showtime for an Emmy. And it's one of my products episodes. I actually wrote it in 24 hours. I wrote the entire script in 24 hours, very few revisions to the final version will be shot. And because it poured out of my heart, I mean, this entire episode, as you saw it, it's a good action episode. There's a lot of killing and mayhem, but it's but the whole episode is essentially a philosophical debate on the nature of Islam, right? And yeah. I poured my entire life's inner struggle and the conversations I've had with other people who don't respect my religion as to what my religion is. And I poured it all in that script and got, and it's, I think it ended up being a pretty magical episode that opened up a lot of people's minds to possibilities. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause like, I remember 15 years ago when I first saw yeah. that episode, like it wasn't an episode that really stood out to me or anything like that, but I found it interesting. But on my rewatch, now that I know you and like, you know, I read your Twitter feed. So like, I see some of your, your religious uh, postings and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. But like, as I was listening to that cleric and especially in, in the scene where like the terror, guys are kind of debating him yeah. I, I, like i heard your voice in there and it, it was really interesting i was like oh that's cameron <laughs> like that's him you know uh you know trying to, to teach us something and and it was well, hopefully not in a, in a preachy way i mean I, I that episode was really about people trying to deal with a situation and this information came out as a result of it but it felt like like okay like i know what your view of islam is and this cleric's view when i was re-watching the show i was like yeah. that's mirroring what i know of cameron's view and it was almost like you were the one who was debating the radical terrorist in, in right. the audience. And uh, and I, I kind of had a new appreciation for it just be, uh, just because I knew you. <laughs> yeah, I knew, I knew you and and there, I mean, it wasn't just to educate the average American about my religion. It was actually to shut down any element within the Muslim community that wants to try to claim that this kind of behavior is Islam and it's normative and it's good. It's not. And it's not from from my point of view, authentically within the religion, it's not, right? And so I had that where the passion came from in those, in those scenes. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that episode a little bit more later, but um, what I wanted to start off with is that I think there's this kind of general ignorance about how TV is written and, you know, how movies are written. Sure. Uh, movies are, are very different in the sense that, you know, writers are kind of used like paintbrushes by directors in movies where, like, they're, I'll bring in this writer to do dialogue. Yeah, we'll, we'll work writer. for hire, you know. Yeah. yeah. And But with TV, TV is a real writer's medium. And uh, in, in the TV world, there are these writers' rooms where it's like a staff of writers who come together and they're kind of led by the executive producers in terms of, like, 
you know, okay, you get this episode and you get this episode. And everyone kind of like works together on everything. So um, what I wanted to ask you was uh, maybe you could inform us what a writer's room for TV is like, how it operates, how scripts are assigned and who's responsible for writing them. Because even though like a, a specific writer may get credited as having written a script uh, for a television episode, that doesn't necessarily mean they were the only ones who worked on that script. Well, you know, uh there's a lot of different versions of writers rooms. I'll share with it what happened on Sleeper Cell, maybe give examples of other versions as well. But you know, the way Sleeper Cell was organized as a writer's room, now, obviously the show had been created by Ethan Riff and Cyrus Boris. They had a very clear vision for it. They actually wrote the first three episodes, uh, but you know, they had written the pilot before there was a writing staff. And then when there was a writing staff, we contributed to the process. And then finally they started farming out other scripts, starting with episode four, the one about the scholar that I mentioned that I wrote, and then, then other staff members were, were writing scripts. The way that show worked is, that uh, you know, we had we had I believe about four, four writers, primarily writers there. Um, I was I started off as a low level writer, uh, and we had we had some producers above us, and then we had the big bosses, Ethan and Cyrus, who created the show. Uh, the, my unique voice allowed me to have a lot more influence than a low level writer normally would. A staff writer or a story editor would normally just be quiet in the room and not talk too much. I had to talk all the time because of who I was and, and the show. Uh, but it basically, it, the way they organized how the story was done on that show is actually, they taught me a lot and it's still how I do it. They created a grid. And I still to this day do this on every show that I've worked on, or that I've, any writing room that I have control over, uh, is they created a, brid, uh, a grid on a, on, a, on a whiteboard where it's laid out all 10 episodes and then laid out, you know, one end of the grid is 10 episodes. The other end of the grid going down this way are the major characters, right? And they essentially plotted out the character arcs of each of those characters over the course of 10 episodes so that we knew where we wanted to start a character at the beginning of the show. We knew where we wanted to end the character at the end of the show. And some of those characters died midway through the show, but we knew where to end them. And that then, once we knew the character journeys across the arc of the show, we could then fill in the details of the episodic struck story structure that would fulfill that. Because we now knew episode you know, four Darwin has to have this revelation in personal growth. And then our major villain, Faris Ofarik, has to get to this place. And the episode, if you remember that episode in particular, about, was about the character growth of the French uh, terrorist, uh, Chris, uh, Christian, who was sent to kill the scholar and then ended up buying into it a bit. And so he was conflicted. So that was, that was like, where does Christian have his turn? So once we knew all, you know, where everyone has the essential character journey of everyone in the episode, the rest is filling in the blanks of how do you get them there, right? The story that's going to satisfy that. And so that was the structure they had on the show. And we would all speak up and, and, and add to it. And I think it's the right way to do it. Uh, I've worked on, to so give an example of other shows I've worked on without necessarily naming the shows. There, there are other shows I've worked on where the showrunner believes make it up as you go along. You know, they don't even necessarily even know where the episode, the season's going to end. They just want, they believe the creative process is a flow. Uh, you know, those shows ended up being successful shows. Uh, the episode ended up largely being good. The process is really painful. The make it up as you go along process doesn't work for me. You know, yeah. you know, there's a lot of time wasted. There's a lot of false starts, a lot of crisis writing when you're running out of time because you still haven't solved the story problem because you haven't thought it out. Um, those shows, that was the methodology of those showrunners and they swore by it because that's how their mind works as a creative person. When I write my own screenplays, I plan out, you know, I do beat sheets and I plan everything out before I write one word. And so I'm more comfortable with what Ethan and Cyrus did. Uh, and I think it's, it leads to a better experience. It leads to less chaos in the writing room. Yeah, in the novel writing community, we call those types of people pantsers because they write by the seat of their pants. Yeah. Um, some they people, ramble on and ramble on. You don't know where this is going to go. They don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people, they like the, the act of discovery where like, like they're they're just making it up as they go. And they're like, oh, I have this idea. And then they do this. But I, I've always been a planner. I like to outline and kind of like figure out the story beats and the character arcs and stuff. Yeah, and discovery right. happens there. The idea that discovery doesn't happen if you plan it. Yeah. I find more discovery happens when you have limitation. We're like, oh, I didn't know I got to end the episode here. So how am I going to make bridge these things that I can't solve? That's where the discovery happens. Yeah. And I, I don't like to tell people like, oh, there's one right way to kind yeah. of plot out a story or, or write a story or something like that. Cause everyone has their own process. But the, you know, uh, when, when you were telling me about, you know, the, your experience with some of these pantsers who were doing like TV shows, I was like, I don't know how anyone can justify spending millions of dollars on something that's just being made up as it goes along. Well, and, and you've hit an important issue there, Matt, because on the shows that I worked on, there were financial crises because of that. I mean, things were off schedule. 
you know, on one show I worked on, uh, the, you know, it was the, you know, because if you have to get the script in, the final script in to the director of the episode by a certain date in pre-production in order for them to film it properly. And if you don't, the Director's Guild penalizes you. You know, there's an actual fine that the show has to pay the Director's Guild for failing to honor the director's time, right? And on one show I worked on, that uh, that fine was budgeted into every episode. It was presumed. <laughs> it was in the line item of the budget because it was never going to be on time. I want to go through your IMDb and try and figure out what that show is. No, 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 no. <laughs> you can make up. I ain't going to confirm it. Anymore. <laughs> but but it's it's funny because you know you look at something like the, the Star Wars sequels, episodes seven through through nine, and it's like that's exactly what happened with them, right? They were just making it up as they went along. There was no communication there. There was no no pre planning. You could say that about all the Star Wars movies under like the Disney regime, mm -hmm. and it's just obvious when you see you know people who are making stuff up as they go along, as opposed to people who actually bother to sit down and plan things out. Uh, and, and you know, George Lucas had a plan. He deviated from the plan over time, but in 77, he had a plan, the Journal of the Wills, he planned this thing out. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's a shame that, uh, you know, more people don't take their craft as seriously as, you know, others do in terms well, of- Well, I mean, it, it's, an art, it's an artistic thing. You know, you know, as you know, as a fellow writer, artists are crazy. We're all a little crazy. We're unstable. And a lot of artists, they can't function under that kind of pressure, which is a problem because in television, that's all there is. There's time pressure. In the movies, you could have two years to keep cranking out because you never know if it's going to get greenlit. TV, you're like, all right, we got to have the script in by this date and it's going to be in production on that date. And you know that, you know, three months in advance. A lot of writers have difficulty with that. And I personally think they, don't show, they shouldn't be in television, but many of them are and many of them are very successful, even though their environment is very chaotic. Now, I know that in TV, there's a specific type of... Um Mm -hmm. like TV structure uh, in terms of like, you know, like you have to have like the the opening teaser and you have to have act one, act two, act three, act four. And yeah. it's it's broken up by traditional um, like commercial breaks in terms of like how, how long an hour long is or versus like a half hour sitcom or what have you. Um, but you guys, because you were on a paid cable network, you didn't really have to worry about those restrictions, but did you still follow that structure? We did, we did, because even though we didn't have commercial breaks, uh, and it's a rule that I still follow to this day. You need to know when the turns are, and you know. And so you, I honestly, I don't recall from 15 years ago whether we wrote end of Act One, but we thought in those terms, right? And so in my scripts that I write, uh, you know, I, you know, when I write for for non-commercial tele for pay television, or that, I still in my scripts put end of Act One, end of Act Two, end of Act Three, because they force the turn of the story. Yeah, and you know, there's there's always this debate about oh, structure is boring. Uh, it just makes everything cookie cutter. Uh, I personally don't believe that. You, you I know, like, exact opposite. Yeah, I think I think structure it, it gives you a good roadmap to follow, and it, it's over time like these beats have been proven. Like okay, when the when the mid you know the reversal at the midpoint happens, like that's where it's supposed to go. And, and the fun of it is the audience psychologically sees storytelling that way. I mean, you know, this is the act structure you're talking about, Matt, was delineated by Aristotle on poetics, right? I mean, 2,500 years ago, right? This is part of the human, it's primordial. Aristotle said that's how human beings see life. They see their own lives in these three act structures, right? You know, to childhood, adult, and, and old age. That's a, the riddle of the Sphinx, right? I mean, that's how we see the world. And the magic of it is knowing that you still, you gotta have a turn at this point of the script is how do you make that surprising? How do you make that surprising every single time? That's the craft, right? It's, you know, it's when I see people saying I got to subvert expectations, just because, you know, you just don't know how to do the craft. Yeah, you have to know the rules before you can break. Yeah. All right. So one thing I wanted to talk about, and I know you weren't involved in the pilot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to discuss the pilot um, with you as a writer, sure. um, because I don't think I've ever seen a better example of how to write a textbook good pilot as it's I've seen with Sleeper Cell. It's a great like, pilot. On my rewatch of this, mm -hmm. I was floored. I, I was like, oh my God, this first episode is everything you want a good pilot to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it had been 15 years since I first seen it. And I was just stunned at like how textbook perfect, like the, the episode was structured, yeah. uh, everything. It, it does everything a good pilot needs to do. It set up the main thrust of the primary narrative of the show. It established the themes that the show is going to explore. It established all the characters, all the main characters in the show and what their backgrounds and relationships were. And it tells a complete standalone story while also setting the stage for the bigger season to come. Exactly. So what I wanted to ask you as a guy who's written 
numerous pilots and done lots of TV. What do you think makes a good pilot for a TV series? And what are the types of tips you can give for crafting one? Well, I think you, I think you actually established them. I mean, you, one of the pivotal things is the pilot should have its own story, right? You should be pulled in to a full story that makes you fall in love with these characters. And I think you need to resolve at least the major issue of that story. And then at the same time, set up where the show is going. I've seen pilot scripts which resolve the great thing, but you're like, well, I don't see the engine of the show, which is the phrase we use, the engine of the show, right? Okay, you solve the problem in the pilot. What's the next episode? I don't see what would set up the next episode, right? Uh, and so that's that's one of the things you have to be able to do both. Funny thing is, you know, I watch, this is gonna make you laugh. It sort of makes me laugh. During this during this lockdown, I've been going back and watching old 70s TV shows, and some of them, they don't really work, but they really do work. Like, I went back and watched the pilot for Wonder Woman with Linda Carter, right? And it's a good pilot <laughs> I mean, because it tells the story of how Wonder Woman meets Steve Trevor and comes to America. And, you know, she has all this. She even joins like a vaudeville act. I mean, it's really some strange stuff happens to her. But it solves the problem. You know, it's like set in the 40s and like the Nazis are doing this stuff. And she defeats the Nazi villain at the end of the episode. And the whole thing is a fully contained story. And at the very end of the episode, you see her now as Diana Prince disguised, right? You know, coming in to be Steve Trevor's assistant, he can't figure out that that's actually the, you know, superhero that he's been fighting alongside for the last hour, right? And so it, it's it, it that's the perfection of it is you come to care about these characters, you solve their problem, you see how they solve their problem, and then you understand their dynamics because of it. And now you see, okay, well, Diana Prince is sitting there, and he doesn't know that's that's Wonder Woman, and you know she's going to help him solve crimes, but she's going to have to hide her identity. I already know what the next episode is going to be, right? And so, and and that that structure works. And the, with Sleeper Cell, that was a genius. Right? It was the main issue, as you remember from the pilot, was uh, we meet this character for the first half of the the brilliance of that pilot, which helps other pilot writing. Is the first half of it? There's we don't see the full truth of things. You know, Darwin we see is a is a is a um, is a criminal that's been released from prison. And he's been told by his his Muslim imam inside the prison, you should get in touch with this guy. And we meet this guy, and we discover this guy is actually like a Saudi terrorist, right? Who's setting up a sleeper cell, and Darwin is recruited to be part of that sleeper cell. And we're following his sort of tense journey into this underworld, and on and then about halfway through the episode of the pilot, he has to go see his parole officer. And we go and we realize in the parole officer meeting, it's not a parole officer. He's actually meeting at the FBI. And then you have this realization, this guy's an FBI agent. It, it's never, it sneaks up on you, right? And you're like, wait a minute, this whole thing I've been watching, I, it's, like, it's like the sixth sense. I haven't understood the first 30 minutes of this pilot. That's good pilot writing, right? Because they don't hit you over the head with it. You're like, this, this scene naturally evolves. You're like, wait a minute. He's 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 an undercover agent, right? And and you're like, and you have this moment of revelation. Now you're really invested, right? And so and and it goes from there, and it resolves the problem of the episode, which is the sleeper cell thinks there's a traitor amongst them, and they end up identifying who they think that is, and that's the fear of is Darwin thinks they're going to identify me, right, as the traitor. They actually misidentify who the traitor is, and they end up killing that person, stoning them to death, which is a really visceral, intense scene that's never been shown in American television before, and seeing this poor guy being tortured. You know, to death by uh, by being stoned. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's not a poor guy; he's a terrorist, right? And Darwin is, is basically was taken out in the desert, so he can't get in touch with his FBI guys to come in and intervene and save this. He's out in the desert without his cell phone and all that stuff, and so he's like, "What do I do?" And they're like, "You got to participate in the stoning." So what's our hero going to do? And the one thing he shocks them is he pulls out a gun. So you're like, "Oh my God, he's gonna he's now revealed that he's a that he's an FBI agent. He's pulling a gun on them, but he's not pulling a gun. He turns." And he shoots this guy who's already basically been tortured to death. He's trying to put him out of his misery because that's the only way he could get out of that situation, right? And uh, But now, okay, so now they come to go, all right, you're one of us. You kill that guy for us. But now we have a new problem because an FBI agent just essentially committed murder, right? Killed a suspect because he's – I mean the gun is on his head. If he doesn't do it, they're going to kill him, right? And this guy is already – from his point of view, this guy's already – being tortured to death, I'm. I got. I. I can die, or I can put this guy out of his misery. I'm gonna do the latter. But now that's the problem: is he's poisoned the case. How can you ever take this case to a to a DA? To because your your lead guy is, is one of them. He's a killer. He's committed. He'd have to go to prison. And so that's the end of the, the pilot. And there's this great moment, the brilliance of it, uh, the genius moment of the filmmaking of that pilot is uh, at the very end 
when you just see Darwin standing in the nightclub, the, the other terrorists all partying the nightclub, they, you know, September 11th guys did that, right? So he's out and he goes to the bathroom and uh, Jay Z song, you know, you know, 99 problems and bitch ain't one, right? Is playing and he's just staring at the mirror, knowing that he's trapped in this world, having committed murder, and he's surrounded by these terrorists who are going to do something terrible. How does he stop them? And you're just like, I want to see what happens next. And that's a genius. All those things I'm describing, this, the, the, the character development, the surprise, the twist at the end, and putting your hero into a situation that's now going to have to resolve over many episodes, that's how you do a good pilot. That's why it's such a good pilot. And you know what's interesting is that, you, you know, so like you said, the first half hour or so, the yeah. pilot plays its cards very close to its chest where, where you don't know what Darwin is, really. You think he's... Yeah. A prisoner, but it, it peppers in these little moments of um, you know someone's watching Darwin. They're taking pictures, yeah. and exactly. you don't quite know what's going on at first. But you, you get the, he's being followed by somebody, right? You get, yeah. you get the sense that he's being followed. But what that actually does is it sets up the reveal that okay, he's an FBI agent. That's why he's being followed. So like it wasn't just out of left field this reveal that he was an FBI agent. It was a very sophisticated way of kind of setting the stage for the audience to ha have that reveal. Absolutely. And so you can look back on, you know, those, those little moments of uh, surveillance and be like, oh, okay, now it makes sense. And uh, I also, you know, you talked about that scene where that terrorist was being stoned. Mm -hmm. And part of the brilliance of this pilot and, you know, the masterful work that you guys on Sleeper Cell did with the characters mm -hmm. is that, you know, this guy, the, this terrorist, we, we get to see his family. We get to see his little girl. You yeah. get to see him as a family man. And it's, it's you know, a birthday party, yeah. We're yeah. And, everything, yeah. And he's kind of like the first guy that Darwin meets. And he's he's this happy go lucky, kind of friendly dude. And uh when he's being stoned, you just hear him like just agonized, like, ah, like like it was one of the most disturbing things I think I've seen on yeah, TV. It's a, it's a really disturbing scene. I mean, yeah. yeah. I don't think that was really created on the other show. <laughs> yeah, and it and it really just shows just like how brutal the, this terror cell is that they're like. I mean, this this guy was one of their own, and and it wasn't like he betrayed them; he just made a mistake. He made a mistake that might get somebody's attention on them. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, I'm going go ahead, please, and then I'll add on to it. And and like you know, watching that scene, like like there's just so many different levels at play in in this pilot. You know, you talked about that moment where uh, Darwin shoots him to put him out of his misery, and he knows that, you know. Uh, this guy's dead anyway, but in a way it's almost like, even though it's a mercy killing, it's also a calculated thing to help him get solidified in the cell. So like, like I said, like everything in this pilot has like multiple different layers. And also the fact it, it's kind of funny when you mentioned like he poisoned the case by killing the suspect um, because in the show in later episodes, they actually talk about that where they, they go to the FBI superiors and he's like, I, I killed this guy, I poisoned the case. And then the FBI is like, okay, well, how can we finagle yeah, this? And then they rash, I say, well, he was probably dead already. We have no evidence he wasn't dead. You were stoning him. You got it, you know, yeah. you just did that for show. That's what we're going to go with. The guy was already dead. He was yeah, stoned dead and you just did that thing to save your life. And so we're going to go with that. The point I'm trying to make is most TV shows would have dropped that thread at the end of the pilot, they would have just been like, well, he, our hero killed this guy, but he was dead anyway, so we're just going to move on. But what what makes your show so you know deep and unique and sophisticated yeah. is that you guys didn't just drop that thread. You actually carried it through and explained uh, a resolution to it because any, like you're a lawyer, you know, like from your legal training probably that if an FBI agent kills this guy in the course of his investigation, like that could poison the case. Yeah. And so any lawyer out there watching the show, if it had just been dropped, they'd have been like, ah, I call shenanigans, you know, but it adds so much authenticity that you guys actually bothered to, you know, follow that. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that's because Ethan and, and Cyrus, they believe in story structure and they realize we set this up. If we set something up, you got paid off. It's 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 it's, it's that that whole thing of Chekhov's gun, right? Which is one of my critiques of, of the movie The Last Jedi, which is it's the anti Chekhov's gun. They set up stuff, and then they're like, ah, Sakai Rocket is the gun, right? And and that's part of it's it, it's done five or six times. You're like, all right, I get it. You're yeah. subverting our expectations, but it's not fulfilling, right? You're not, it's not fulfilling, you know. And it shows that you're being lazy because you don't know how to pull the gun. You don't know how to do it. Whereas yeah. we, we found we how do you get out of that situation? The guy's shot somebody, an FBI agent has killed, you know, a suspect. Right, in shot him. How do you get out of it? And we found a way out of it. We're like, all right, they're just going to essentially cover it up, but they have a way to rationalize it to themselves. The guy was already dead. You didn't kill anybody. Yeah, and you, you know, you talked about um, 
Ethan and Cyrus's yeah. kind of love of structure. Yeah. And when you look at the the first season as a whole, like it, it's really interesting because the first season it starts or the first episode it starts the very first image yeah. is Darwin praying towards Mecca, yeah. and it starts with him praying. And then the very last image of the season is Darwin praying. And that that kind of bookends the, the right. seasons. Which and is it, how I like to do storytelling. I I try to bookend episodes and I try to bookend entire seasons. I mean, that's we have very similar philosophies. Uh, Ethan Cyrus and I on storytelling that way. But you, you know, when you look at it from a, a craft perspective, yeah. like, like that's the type of thing that only someone who actually planned out the season would be able to pull off. Because like someone who was just making it up as they went along, they wouldn't have even thought to end the, yeah. the series the same way they began the series. And it just shows that level of forethought and sophistication that I think really makes the show stand out. Yeah. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, we kind of touched on this earlier, uh, which is the, the theme of this show. And uh, Sleeper Cell seems to deal with this theme of what is true Islam and how is it perverted to suit evil agendas and the consequences of, of it being perverted in such a way. And though the terrorists see themselves as holy warriors, they see themselves as the good guys, the true holy warrior in the series is really that of Darwin and his quest mm -hmm. to preserve and protect what he believes his religion is, is yeah. about. And we constantly see how the Islamic religion is not only perceived by you know, outsiders, um, but it's also, we see how it's misinterpreted throughout the series by these fundamentalists yeah. and these radicals. And in a sense, the show is almost a metaphor for like a civil war of ideals within Islam. And, and we use that phrase. I mean, it, the the idea of a civil war within Islam is used throughout the show because ultimately, you know, as we, as we later saw in later historical events, ISIS arose, and ISIS spent most of its time killing Muslims. Right? I mean, it spent most of its time killing other Muslims, right? And so that that's the thing. These kinds of terrorists, they they, from my point of view, are people that are essentially trying to destroy Islam from within. And we explore that. And uh, th this theme, what, what makes this theme very interesting is that it's tied directly into the motivation of the main protagonist, Darwin. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was, what can you tell us about this kind of civil war theme of you know what what is true Islam and how it's utilized in the show and how the writers wanted to communicate it and have it integrated in the story in such a way where it's directly tied to the main character? Well, you know, it's interesting because the pilot itself, uh, you know, it doesn't really delve too much into theology. Um, and there's only just one moment where, when we, we discover that that Darwin is is an FBI agent, where he, his handler, you know, Agent Fuller was, was a great actor and, you know, he was around for a bit and his character ended up getting killed. But, you know, he's the he represents the skeptical American. He represents a lot of the people who criticize me on Twitter who are like, you're an Islamist propagandist, right? You're trying to get our guard down. And so in some ways, this FBI agent's like, yeah, you're a great agent, but I don't want to hear about your religion, right? Because I don't really know that there's anything good to it. And even in the pilot, Darwin says, my religion literally means Islam means peace, right? It, it comes out of salama, which means peace. It means, you know, the peace of the heart. And so he says that. And then later on on the show, we get to expand it much more. Uh, certainly by the time we have the theological debate in my episode, in episode four, it gets the entire episode is about this, you know, this what... I believe Mormon of Islam to be and what these people are doing with it. So that is the theme that goes throughout the show. And at the same time, you know, we wanted to show the conflict that's happening to Darwin, our character, who is an FBI agent. He's an African American man. He's a practicing Muslim and he's an American, right? Okay. And so all of those elements have tensions, right? And so there was an episode that came that was in the first season where Dar Darwin discovers there's a new character in in the game, and you know there is essentially a jihadist who's been fighting American soldiers in Iraq, who's actually an American convert. It's based on a real person, right? And but the difference is he considers himself a traditional Islamic warrior, which is traditional Islam. You don't kill women and children. You don't kill non-combatants. And a, a soldier of an invading army is a lawful target, right? It's it's and so he viewed the American soldiers in Iraq as invaders, and so he had been attacking them, but he wouldn't target non-combatants. And he viewed the sleeper cell as evil people who are killing women and children, right, and killing non-combatants. And so Darwin is faced with this thing. There's this great moment in in the episode where, you know, he's telling the handler, "Well, we found this guy. And this is what he's about." And he's explaining him, and the handler's like, "You sound like you admire him." And Darwin says this line, which is. Uh, you know, maybe I do admire him. I admire the fact that he has these ethical ideals. But at the same time, I hate him because he's killing my fellow Americans. Darwin's a former ranger. So he's, he, 
I mean, he's been ki- this guy's been killing people like that were in, in in Darwin's own troop that he bonded with, right? So that's the conflict he's facing. He's an American, he's an FBI agent. At the same time, as a Muslim, he understands this guy who that he's not the same as a terrorist. He's still an enemy of of the United States because he's fighting American soldiers, but he's not a terrorist. And that has a level a level of uh, sophistication that I've never seen anywhere since or <laughs> since then, where we're de- delineating combatants and ideology and Darwin's inner conflict about that. So we tried to explore that, and and I'm very proud of it because no one else has done it since then. Well, what, what makes Darwin such an interesting character is that he does have this kind of like rigid moral center where he, yeah. he's an idealist and he has a very strong moral code. And it, it's constantly challenged as he goes throughout this journey. Yeah. And he th- probably the biggest danger isn't so much that, you know, the physical aspect of him getting discovered and killed. Uh, the constant co- conflict and danger that he runs up against is like these philosophical ideas where he's either got to justify his his moral code to himself or he's actually got to, you know, try to save people from going too far down this radicalized path without tipping his hand that he actually doesn't believe in, you know, some of these like harder edge type things. But the, the whole theme of, of this, uh, you know, what true Islam is that goes throughout the, the series I just got to hand it to you guys because it, it was so well well balanced. And if you look at like, I, I hate to compare stuff to the Last Jedi, uh, well, but you know, brought together. you know, Ryan Johnson for all all of his faults, he is kind of like a high minded filmmaker. He he does have like high concepts that he sure, he sees himself as a philosopher. I think that's fair. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, like in terms of like the craft of filmmaking, not so much storytelling, but uh, filmmaking. Oh, like, well, he's brilliant as in the visual director. He's absolutely brilliant. Even the last one, which I don't like is a well shot. Yeah, but, but, but if you look at how he layers in his theme of the last Jedi, which, which is about failure, you know, yeah. and, and stuff like that. Um, like a lot of people kind of misconstrue the idea that just because you have a theme, um, it works. Well, and, that, uh, that's what most of its defenders say it has such important themes. I'm like, yeah, but they're they're not executed well in my opinion. So yeah, and, and they're bad themes because yeah. they're inherently negative. They're they're, yeah. they're not uplifting. Yeah. It, it's about you know you know like the the real theme of the Last Jedi, in my opinion, is is uh, you know as, as they state in the movie, yeah. it's, it's about failure. Yeah, it's and, it's it's nihilism in my view. That's yes. yeah, exactly. And uh, w- what made kind of uh, your show stand out to me yeah. at least was the fact that you, you know darwin comes up against the darkest most terrible kind of aspects of humanity yeah. and but he he never gives up the fight for like his ideals and in that sense like even though this show is very kind of like disturbing and and hardcore at its core there's like an optimistic kind of message of hope at that you know well, certainly uh, in season one people certainly, think that season two well, may not be that yeah. Well, even in season two, that the, there's that message, even though it gets more tragic, and we'll talk about that a little bit yeah. later. Um, but um, I, I feel like uh, that's another sign that of just how sophisticated Sleeper Cell is as a, as a TV show. Was you guys were able to carry through these themes in, in such a competent way that uh, we're not always used to seeing in, yeah. in TV shows. Yeah. No, I was like, I was very proud of the show. It's it's unlike anything that I've worked on since, and I've worked on shows that are highly regarded. Uh, and I've been proud to work on those shows, but it is something that is special both in my career and I really think in Hollywood history because nothing has been done like it in 15 years that I've seen. So what I wanted to talk to you about, um, getting back to kind of like structure and writing and stuff, is with the advent of streaming services, a lot of original series are now developed as kind of like a a long movie, multi-hour long movie. Sure. Uh, case in point, you know, we have Marvel's Netflix shows where when before they premiered, they were basically came out and said, like, we're handling these as 13 hour films, basically. Yeah. And Sleeper Cell was kind of marketed as a miniseries. You said it didn't start off that way, but uh, the Showtime kind of marketed it as a miniseries. And uh, this was long before the, this kind of idea of bingeable streaming series hit, hit, hit mm-hmm. you know, big. Yeah. And yet it plays out the same way. It plays out like you know, if you watch the first season, like that's a 10 hour movie. Yeah. Uh, it's not an episodic TV show. It's a 10 hour movie. Like you would watch well, exactly it because it was structured to have an, a fully told tale. So that's exactly. how it was. Yeah. Um, so some would say that this is the, you know, foundation of what a miniseries is, is just a long movie, but um, sleeper cell did this nearly a decade before it really became kind of normal, commonplace practice. Yeah, and the world wasn't set up. You couldn't, at the time there really weren't DVRs 
or they weren't popular. And so you had to tune in <laughs> to watch, or you had to set your VCR, right, <laughs> to, to watch this show. And, uh, and so now it, the idea of binging has been changed because we have our DVRs and, you know, I'll go through an you know, entire season of Riverdale in two days at home. So what I wanted to ask you was, was the show planned as more of a 10 hour movie in terms of like how you guys structured it? And uh, do you think this technique was ahead of its time when you were making the show or was it something that you guys just felt was natural? Well, I mean, I, I think it was definitely seen as a 10-hour movie because, again, the structure that the gentleman had created, which is correct and in my personal the right way I do things, is they laid out the entire, before we wrote one episode, they had written the pilot, before we wrote one episode of the rest of the show, they laid out the entire story of the show. We spent weeks on that. And to this day, when I work on a show that I control the writing staff on, uh, I lay that out. I will spend two to three weeks just figuring out every single story structure going through the entire course of the season and that's that's the way they did it so it was always meant to be a full-length movie of 10 hours because we thought of it that way and uh and and that was good and yeah and it, it was prescient because people weren't doing that i mean it's i'm sure there were shows that were doing something similar but you know a lot of shows you just the, the way things were being and to, to a large degree still today in, in in network television is that you're not given a full season order let's say you know, you'll get 13 episodes, and then you might get picked up for the back nine. So you have 22 episodes, right? The older. And so you'd have to, if you even wanted to plan it out, you couldn't plan it out beyond that. You could plan out your 13 episode arc, and then, well, what do we do now? We got we got nine more, right? And that, in many ways, Riverdale show that I mentioned that I am actually, uh, I, it's one of my guilty pleasures. I really enjoy that show. It one of the storytelling critiques you can make of it is you can always feel, oh, they just got to the end of their 13 episode order. Now they got another nine that they've tacked on, right? <laughs> they're just like, you know, I thought we just caught the serial killer in Riverdale in episode 13. Oh, there's another serial killer for the next nine episodes, right? Yeah, they, so, they call that the mid-season finale, right? Yeah, the mid-season. And the, these were terms that developed later. But that's the mindset of how people still think in network television, uh, you know, is that they're not thinking in terms of an entire season. And I think that can create problems. Whereas as a result of, of where we are with cable and, and Netflix and all this, other shows who have substantially small orders, they tend, they're now, they used to be 10, now they're getting down to eight, six. You tend to just plan out the whole thing. And you, you know, it's interesting because if you look at a show like 24, mm -hmm. um, they were running into issues where like, you, you know, the first half of, of their seasons yeah. would be like really taut and really well, well written. And then like when they got to that mid season finale point, uh, they were, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're like, oh, well, we're, we're just going to start a whole new story arc. Uh, that's completely unrelated, uh, you know, uh, to what had came in the first half of the season, and that's why I think a show like Twenty Four was, was like so uneven in the sense that like it really needed to be like a ten episode yeah. like series. Would you guys have been able to do like twenty two episodes of of the uh, first season of Sleeper Cell? I mean, I think Ethan and Sai are very smart guys, and I think they would have figured that out. I think again because we looked at it in terms of a long term arc. We would have had to broke out a board of twenty-two episodes, right? Um, I think if it had been that we had been given ten episodes and then halfway through the process it got doubled, where extra episodes were added on, we'd have to rethink our break of everything, right? We'd have to go back to the drawing board. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we could pull it off, and I think the world that we created could probably sustain twenty-two episodes because there's a lot to explore. And you know, the good thing about Sleeper Cell was. You know, we had action every episode, but it was a talky show. It was about character dynamics, right? So you don't have to have like Jack Powers under this literal time gun of you got to got you know you, you got to in real time you got to finish all this in one hour. With us, you'd have you know ten minutes of guys sitting around in the bowling alley, alley talking about their girlfriends and about is premarital sex really against Islam because I want to bang my girlfriend, right? And you'd have ten, and then they're like, okay, we got to go kill that guy. <laughs> and so, but you'd have all this time for for human connection. Yeah, but you know what was interesting about Sleeper Cell is, like, it wasn't action heavy, yeah. but it was so tense that, like, you know, you felt like it by the end of the episode, even though it was mostly just people talking, you, you felt like, oh my god, like, like there was so much stuff stuff that happened, even though it was just people talking. Well, and that's a, the reason of the tension is this because the tension comes out of the fact that in that talking, Darwin can slip up. In that talking, he can say something that's going to get him killed. That's going to reveal who he is, right? That's a, you know one of the rules of being an undercover guy is don't talk, man. Get the other guys talking, right? And now we got to show where the guy, our hero, has got to talk and he's got to not blow his cover. Yeah, and he can't even talk to like you know um, the uh, what's her name, uh, his girlfriend. 
yeah, yeah. Um, Bruce Sage Miller, our actress, but Gail, Gail. Yeah, Gail. Yeah, like like he, you can tell like every episode he wants to talk to Gail and tell her what's going on, but he just can't. Yeah. Um, but uh, that 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 brings me to my next talking point here, which is that you know the structure of this series is that each episode kind of focuses around a primary group of characters in the sleeper cell, working on different aspects of their master plan. Uh, that is, you know, kind of being revealed piece by piece as, as the yeah. show goes along. And typically this aspect is introduced really early on in each episode and the characters spend the rest of the episode trying to achieve this goal yeah. uh, that, you know, is being introduced. Um, but each of these elements lead up to the big reveal of the main terror attack and what that's going to be at the end of the series. Um, so what I wanted to ask you is how did the writers determine what the ultimate attack was going to be? And how did they figure out how it was going to be accomplished? And what was the process of breaking this down to write the series around it? Because you really, I, I, I kind of have a feeling that you guys worked backwards where like you, you knew what the final attack was going to be. Then you're like, how can I drip feed this out um, over the course of, of 10 episodes? But I, I wanted to hear like what the actual process was for that. Well, you know, part of the process of laying out the, the, the seasonal arc was event we had to figure out what the big terror attack was. And that actually took a long time. It was we for the longest time, as I, I mean, I'm recalling from 15 years ago, and, and Ethan, my friend, that's not how we did it, and you may be right. But this is my recollection. So, uh, as I recall, we spent a lot of time on all these character arcs, and you know, we just knew X person is going to die in this episode. We didn't necessarily know how they were going to die in that episode. We just knew they had to get. And then we're like, and for the longest time, you know, like it, it, we had the block of the big terror attack, and we didn't fill in what that was. We just knew it was happening. So once we had figured out the emotional arcs of the characters, that was the the meat of a lot of the conversation. Then we're like, all right, well, how do we figure in these details? And eventually, in the first season, we we, we settled on, uh, you know, essentially this uh, this chemical attack that basically that they were going to hijack uh, a chemical uh, you know, tanker and explode it at the, like the Super Bowl, right? And then every you know, you know hundred thousand people would die from the from the from the the, the, the gas that would come out from the cloud. Uh, it took us a long time to come to that was going to be our, our story. And then once we understood that, we had to backfill in on our whiteboard the details of how much is revealed. So we knew that we had to, okay, if it's going to be, if it's going to be an attack that's going to require you know, this kind of chemical thing, okay, then we're going to need to have them dealing with, you know, is it an, you know, we actually had some misleads. We had the thing where he thinks it's an anthrax attack, right? And so they have, they, we have entire scenes where they're getting all ready. They're, you know, they're shooting themselves up with Cipro to protect themselves from their own anthrax. Right? Turns out the anthrax is fake. It was a test, right? And so that gave us time to figure out like what the real attack is. But eventually, once we had it, we had to set up each of the pieces to make it make sense. And then we were ready to go to script. I think that's one of the big disadvantages that pantsers have, you know, guys who are making up as they go, is like, if you don't know where you're going, uh, you take a lot of detours on the way and, and you spend a lot of time, like, Lost is a good example of this, the mm -hmm. show Lost. Where basically, like you know, they were just going in every which. Every yeah, no, that, that was lost entire. I mean, that that is an example of a show that was run by the other philosophy, which is you know, Mr. Lindelof, who's you know, a well-regarded screenwriter. His philosophy. Not, not me. <laughs> I will, I will, I will keep my comments personal <laughs> comments to myself. I'll just leave that there. I've already made my comments about Last Jedi, which have not made me friends with a lot of people. So be it. <laughs> but but Mr. Lindelof's, Damon Lindelof's philosophy is make it up as you go along. He seems. He's fine with that. I'm not sure that it always works. I don't think it, it, it worked a lot and lost it by the end. So, yeah, but uh, I, I always think that when you're planning out, especially like like thrillers, where there's a very specific kind of like plan that's going on that the that the main character has to uncover, you always need to know where you're going. And so, for a writing technique, starting with okay, this is the, the this is where we're going to end up, and then figuring out how you stretch that out going yeah. backwards. Is is probably a good writing technique. Would you agree with me on that? I, I, I absolutely. I mean, you know, I need to know where I'm ending, and then I need to know how to get there. So for me, whenever I structure any script, even if it's a movie script I'm writing by myself, uh, or it's the pilot of a script, or it's the arc of a show, I actually break it out three ways. I first, well, what's the opening? I know what the opening is, whether it's the opening scene or the first episode. I know where I want to end it, and then I get to the midpoint. Uh, and in a pilot script, that might be, you know page 30 of, of the script, I, I know that I, the opening scene is going to be this thing, and I know I want to end the, the episode with the shocking moment. All right, how do I get from this thing to that shocking moment, where there's going to be a midpoint where something happens that's going to make that progression logical? And so once I figure out the midpoint, then I personally, I do that throughout the process. I go, okay, I now know I now know the, the beginning, the end, the midpoint. Well, between the beginning and the midpoint, there's page 15. 
So how do I get from the beginning to the midpoint? And then I fill in the page with the end. And I backfill it that way. And I do that both for scripts. Every script I've written since the very first script I wrote 20 years ago has been done that way. And I do that for episodic arcs where I will know the pilot. I will know the, the climactic finale of the season. Then I go to, if it's a 10 episode order, I go to episode five. If I need to get to this, you know, if the first episode is you, you meet the hero and either, and he's entering into the, into the sleeper cell, the final episode is uh, he defeats a sleeper cell's plan. The middle episode has to be, you find out essentially what the sleeper cell's plan is, right? <laughs> you know, because that's the logical connecting point, right? And then, okay, when, so how do you go from beginning, which is I meet the hero and I find out the hero, the, the sleeper cell's plan episode five. So around episode three, let's say the middle of that, you got got to get earn their trust so that he will be allowed to know the plan by episode five. So something has to happen. Episode three, if you remember on Sleeper Cell, the episode three, uh, they they went to Mexico, if I remember correctly, right? They went that to Mexico. You want episode? And, yeah, and he saved the the villain's life from the Mexican drug lord that they were doing deals with, and it went bad, and it turned into a shootout. And our hero could have let the head terrorist die, but he needs to keep the case alive. So he then saved. Your hero would have been over. <laughs> and you know because you know because they're like this guy dies great but there's still a cell out there with a plan i gotta so he saves the bad guy you know the the head the head of the cell played brilliantly by odette fair one of our, the greatest actors i've ever worked with and then he's earned the trust of the bad guy so you know by the time he gets episode five they're going to be ready to tell him what's going on right so that's the logic of how you do for me how you do a show as well as an episode of art you figure out the beginning, the end, and the middle point, and you keep back from it. And you know, you kind of touched on uh, what uh, my process as well, which is basically the process of, of outlining. Uh, which is, uh, I always like to start with my ending, so you know mm -hmm. your end. Then you hit what I call these other milestones, which is the mm -hmm. beginning and the middle. Once you have those three points, you can start figuring out what needs to go in between them, yeah. and you can do that on a micro scale, which is like maybe episode by episode, and you can do it on a macro scale, which is season by season. And it works the same way in movies, it works the same way in novel. And it's just like a really good, like kind of method of plotting out how you want your, your story to go. So it's nice to know we're on the same page. We're on the same page. And I, and, and, uh, you know, I found it to be, to be incredibly invaluable. I'm shocked by how many people that's startling to them. How many professional writers like, well, we do it that way. I was like, is there another way? <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> so. so one aspect of the show that I find really interesting is that Sleeper Cell is based around a group of what are essentially bad guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I always find bad guys far more interesting than good guys, yeah. um, just because, you know, uh, there's so many different aspects to them. Mm -hmm. And the show does a great job of showing us the different aspects of all the different terrorists in the Sleeper Cell. <laughs> Uh, like we're given all their backstories, we're given their motivations for why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, we see these different aspects of them, making them feel more like real characters as opposed to caricatures of like you know the mustache twirling uh, villainous terrorist. Um, and these characters, what, what what I was struck by when I was rewatching the show was that you guys constantly give these characters opportunities to move away from their villainy throughout yeah. the course of the show, um, and these guys always ultimately reject these opportunities, which kind of cements them as villains. And also as tragic villains, because yeah. they, they, they could have taken another path. Yeah, well, it, in that sense, all villains are kind of tragic, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so their motivation for rejecting these opportunities is, is always kind of explained. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, like there's just so many things, like for instance, um, one of the things that stood out to me uh, when I was watching it was uh, the character of uh, Elia. Elias? Yeah, Ilya, 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 yes. Ilya, Ilya. Um, so he, he's this, this Bosnian who, you know, his entire family was murdered in, in, you know, the Bosnian War. And he comes to America and he's kind of, his day job is like a substitute teacher or something like that. And there's this woman in, in among the faculty who teaches another class at, at his school. And she, I guess she has some background um, from Bosnia as well. And she's kind of into him. And she, you know, one day, like in the, during a science experiment, she kind of invites him out to coffee. Yeah. And the entire time he's at coffee, this is a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. She's obviously into him. And she's kind of given him this opportunity. It's like, hey, you know, like 
here's a, a pathway to happiness where you don't have to be killing people. Yeah. You can be a school teacher and you can have this normal life with, with this beautiful woman. And the only thing he can focus on is th these old prejudices that he had back in Bosnia. Yeah, he's stuck in a pathology, yeah. Exactly. And and he just starts like treating her like so terribly. And she's just shocked because like she, she's like, I like this guy. Why is he being so mean to me? And he's just kind of like storms off. And the, uh, the first season, and to some extent, the second scene is just filled with scenes like this where the these terrorists that we're coming to know uh, throughout the course of 10 episodes are constantly just given outs. They're, they're constantly given uh, opportunities to just not be assholes and they constantly reject them. Uh, so what I wanted to ask you was, um, how do you write such vile characters, but still somehow make them sympathetic, likable, and relatable to the audience? Well, you know, of the show, Ilya is the most sympathetic character because he's a he's a Bosnian man whose entire family was massacred by Serbs during the during the war, right? And he is deeply psychologically damaged from that and can't get away from it. Uh, and he's just motivated in revenge. He blames America for not saving them saving his people and that he wants revenge for that and it consumes him uh so he's the most tragic of them all uh you know the pivotal thing for any of characters you know is and i think you would agree this is that you have to see their humanity you know every villain sees himself as the hero you know one of the reasons that that ethan and cyrus cast and brilliantly cast oded fair to play faris al farak the head of the saudi uh terrorist cell and he's an israeli guy and he's playing this, this saudi guy and and Oded is an incredibly handsome, charismatic guy. He exudes rock star energy, right? You know, and he's not your mustache twirling villain. And they told me that one of the things that inspired that casting was they had seen, I think there had been some terror incident in London where some guys blew themselves up. They'd been surrounded by the London cops in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a house and they blew themselves up. And these guys, you know, you, when you saw video clips of who they were before they killed themselves, they looked like rock stars. They were exuding this. I mean, they were, you could see why they become cult leaders. They were handsome. They were passionate. And they felt, were filled with some kind of righteous zeal against evil in their minds. And so Dead Fair plays that. He, he plays someone who, and you later discover his backstory and his family and, and other things. But he's ultimately somebody who sees the world as a place that's been corrupted and full of, of villainy through the forces of imperialism that have held the Muslim world down and have really crushed them. And so he's coming from a place of, of really deep idealistic, uh, you know, fervor, which then leads him to commit evil, right, and rationalize it. And, and all of them are in that way deeply damaged people, and Darwin's a damaged person. So whenever you tell a villain, and that's why the original Star Wars is so good, because Darth Vader is this tragic villain. And, you know, and I actually am a fan of the prequels, and I like seeing the progression of how you see the, his fall. Uh, and so that's, that's what makes a compelling villain is that you realize this could happen to me, you know, if by the grace of God, I don't want to, you know, you know they're, 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 how does that phrase go? They're but the grace of God, the goai, right? And so, and, and that's how you write a compelling villain. When, when I wrote my Crusades novel, you know, the novel is unusual because most Crusades novels are told from the, the Crusaders' point of view, right? This was told from the Muslim and the Jewish point of view. And so you had the crusader warriors, Richard the Lionheart, who was a major figure in American Western culture. He's always associated with Robin Hood. He's a real guy. He was a barbaric guy. He killed women and children left and right. His own men hated him. After the crusade, his men basically imprisoned him in Germany and left him there, right, because they hated him so much. And yet he's mythologized as hero. So I wanted to show this guy for the villain that he did. At the same time, being a Muslim writer, I didn't want, want to be accused of, oh, you've got this plastic hero of a good Saladin Muslim king finding this evil hero of a Christian guy, right? So I, I showed the complexity of Richard the Lionheart. What would motivate him to become a man that would commit these massacres? You know, and, and, his, and the way I did it in the book was looking at his deep alienation from his father, which is historical, and his deep feeling of pain in that father-son relationship, his desire to show his father that he could be as ruthless a king as his father was. And that psychological motivation actually humanizes him. And you realize this guy is just a lost kid. He literally was. He was a 25-year-old king killing people left and right. He's just trying to make his dad like him. And then you don't see him as the same kind of villain anymore. And getting back to Sleeper Cell, what I found interesting was, okay, so you have all these different characters. And, and when they're initially introduced, like they're just kind of stock, uh, um, kind of almost stereotypical bad guys. Yes. 
Um, probably my least favorite of the group was Tommy, just because yeah, like, the yeah, actor was great. I don't, I don't know that we did him all justice all the time. Well, I mean, I mean good actor, but like he played the douchebag perfectly, yeah. and like his whole so the, thing, uh, the, the American sort of surfer dude who gets in the wrong crowd. Yeah, yeah, and his whole thing was like he was rebelling against his his parents. His yes. parents were like ultra liberal, hippie type, you know, people, and they yeah. they just kind of neglected him, and so his entire life was about rebelling against. What, what they liked, and he joined and again, the military. And let me add to that, every character, and speaking of time, every character in the first season of Sleeper Cell, every single character was based on a real person. Yeah. Uh, and Tommy is based on some of these jihadists that have been captured, right, in, in Iraq at the time, right, or uh, who are these, you know, a, a lot of them are European guys who just ended up uh, with this cast of character because they were alienated by their hippie parents, right? And he yeah. wanted to capture <clears throat> And what was interesting about Tommy is, so, like, it's established that, you know, He's doing this because of you know he uh, he he joined the army to rebel against his parents, and then when the army rejected them, he wanted to find something that he could then rebel against the army with, and that was this radical Islam type thing. And so he's kind of a stupid character, and he's not very likable. But at the same time, like he shows like these the, these glimpses of like oh like he's actually kind of like you know. A, a, a good guy and then when his mom comes by and you see how much she loves him and, and how desperate she is to try to you know bring him back into the fold as her son it, it, it and he just keeps rejecting it because like he's just so resentful like he just can't let go of this hate and, and that seems to be kind of a running theme with all these guys in the sleeper cell is like they refuse to let go of the pain of their pasts and that just keeps them set in in down this like tragic path that you know is ultimately going to play out. So we talked about how that happened with Elijah. We talked about how that happened with Tommy. Then there's Christian, mm -hmm. who you, you know talk about another guy who's a douchebag. But you yeah. know like we get these moments where he calls up his his wife, wife, and she's you know and he's alienated from her. She doesn't want to be associated with him now that he's on this path. Yeah, and but you can tell like just how much he loves her and how much he misses her. And in the episode you wrote, you like we'd never seen her up until that episode, and then like it reveals that like oh she's pregnant with his baby. Yeah. And you know, like if he just if she had just picked up that phone and told him, like he would have he would have left. Yeah. He wouldn't have been part of yeah, that. It was all about he was trying to prove he was a man to her, right? Yeah. He'd be like a man. And uh, and you know, he's and the in the episode of the scholar, he's the primary focus of that because he's the guy that's been brainwashed. He used to be a, a skinhead. So he went from one extremism, he falls in he's a skinhead who hates Arabs and Afri and black people in France. And then suddenly he falls in love with an Arab woman. And so he hasn't gotten that extremist out of him, he just transformed into, well, I'll be an extremist in your culture, right? That's all I know how to do, right? And he's in many ways a very tragic figure because he really does have a chance. He could have done the right path and helped the scholar, but he doesn't, he kills him. And uh, and then he ultimately pays the, he's the one that gets the karmic come up into more than a lot of them. Yeah, and that episode that you wrote with the scholar uh, where you know his, his philosophy kind of resonates the most with Christian, yeah. Uh, where Christian's almost like, you, you know, maybe there is something to this. Um, that's another one of those like opportunities where it's like, hey, we're giving you this opportunity to get out. And uh, and he just continues to reject it yeah. um, ultimately. And uh, it, it just, it, it makes these villains uh, in, in this show just so much more interesting to me uh, to see like how they justify just rejecting these opportunities yeah. as they come at them and holding on to, to this pain that they have that's part of their backstory. And it, it's really sophisticated. I, I think it, it's, it makes the show, it, it's what made the show so interesting to me is, is like I was actually caring about the, the, these terrible evil people, you know? And, and at the same time, you see them as evil. I mean, you, you don't end up being on their side. But you, yeah. you they're, human, they're human beings because they but, are human beings, and you know. But, but you're, you're kind you're, of like I, I wish I wish you would just choose not to be evil, so like I could like you more, yeah. you know. But speaking of that, um, in keeping with the whole bad guy notion, and you talked about the incredible Oded Fair, who uh, I only knew from the Mummy uh, yeah. before this. Uh, Brendan Fraser is the Mummy, yeah. um, but uh, he he is. Love. I love those movies. He is the main bad guy in the show. He plays a character named Ferris Alferic. Yeah. Am I, I pronouncing that right, Ferric? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Farrick is like, uh, he is such a great villain. Um, like he, he's like, he's like the big daddy villain of, of the series. And uh, what makes him so good is, is like he's smart, he's competent, uh, you know, he's good looking. He's, he's kind of like, he's got these alpha male traits to him. And he's always two steps ahead of both Darwin and the FBI. Like he's just, he's just like on another level 
mm -hmm. uh, of operation. And um, but he's also quite menacing, you know, like like he's, he's a guy who always presents a very real threat whenever he's on screen. And not only is he a threat to our primary protagonist, but he's also pretty much a threat to everyone he deals with. Everyone in the sleeper cell is afraid of him. Uh, all the business uh, associates are afraid of this guy. And he presents a really formidable obstacle for Darwin to overcome. And uh, though he's kind of fleshed out, you get the sense that all the bad guys, in, out of all the bad guys in the show, he's the most irredeemable and the most dangerous. So in short, he's basically a textbook example of a villain that we love to hate. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're a Star Wars fan. I can definitely see like elements of like Darth Vader and and Ferric, and uh, how he just goes about like when he walks into a room, he just like fucking owns the room, you know. Yeah. And, uh, my arrival, you know that. Yeah, they got yeah, and, and and you know like like uh, you're a traitor to the Rebel Alliance and take her away. You know, you know like he's just he's very decisive. Uh, you, you know, he, he he's very good at manipulating people. And uh, what, what I wanted to ask you is, what are some of the tips that you can give people on writing such a strong antagonist for your story? Like, how do you make a good villain that people just love to hate? Well, I mean, you hit on many of those things. I mean, you have to have somebody who, you, in order to be a real villain, I mean, there's there's the villain that's, you know, Ted Bundy out there just killing people, right? That's okay. That to me is not an interesting villain. He's a scary villain. And then there's someone who leads, you know, the leader of men villain is the most dangerous and is the most frightening. And that's what he is because he is someone that that is incredibly charismatic and you want to like him and you can see why people are seduced to his point of view. And that's the person you want. You, you want to imagine someone as a villain that you'd want to follow, that you want as your, your guide, your friend, your protector, your dad. I mean, that's the kind of villain. If you can imagine that villain, that's a villain that people will be will be brought into. You know, I, I think in some ways Hannibal Lecter plays that villain, right? Because in the relationship with Clarice, it's a father-son relationship. I'm father-daughter. I'm sorry, father-daughter relationship. Uh, and don't assume her gender. You know, as I said, you know, we're <laughs> that it, we're 2020. God bless, right? Father-daughter relationship. Uh, and I'm just going to go with that. And forgive me, uh, but you know, but but it's the relationship is this: is you know, she is, he's both her, her father figure to her. And he's also her psychological therapist, right? He's trying to help her come to terms with her own demons, right? And and ultimately, you know, he, as she herself says, he's, when he escapes, he's not a threat to me because coming after me would be kind of rude, right? I mean, that's an interesting villain, right? Like coming after me, I don't. He's never going to come and kill me because he would consider that rude, right? Uh, because they have a bond, and so that that is a, that is a compelling villain. Is that you know when you have a villain that's black and white it's not interesting uh you know it, it is it is and I, I think i think robert harris who created the character um or thomas harris i'm forgetting the author's name but the, the gentleman created the character he uh you know he i think he went a little too far with that in his subsequent thing you know with hannibal i read the book and i, I didn't like the book i mean he goes so far into his backstory and then ends up perverting the relationship so that clary ends up being in the book at least she ends up being with hannibal lecter at the end essentially becoming his lover which made no sense right that's where you know, you've now subverted yourself, right? And you've made the villain so human that you've lost an understanding of all the other characters, right? You, you all, the genius of the villain is that you are seduced by them, but you don't go to them. And when they actually did the Hannibal movie, the director wisely corrected it. You have the pivotal moment at the end where he's essentially offering Clarice the chance to join him. And in the movie version, she goes, no, I'm not going to be like you, even though you can see why she might want to join him. That's the right storytelling. And one of the things that I think makes a really good villain, and uh, the character of Farik exemplifies this perfectly, is being hyper competent, being super good at your job as a bad guy. You know, like if you look at how Farik operates, he never makes a mistake. And any mistake that is made, it's made because someone deceived him. And he had good reason to trust that person, particularly Darwin, because Darwin saved his life like a couple times. But one of the things that struck me about Farik as a character was just like how sociopathic this guy was. Like, uh, you know, we talked about the Tijuana episode a little bit earlier, which is basically uh, they have a hiccup in their funding and they have to go down to Mexico in order to fix it. And while they're there, Darwin kind of stumbles upon like this like horrible aspect where like, the people that they're in business with are are trafficking underage children for sex, yeah. and he goes to Farik and he's he's like, "This isn't what what you know we're about, dude. Like we we need to get these guys to change their ways." And Farik's just kind of like, 
not really caring about it, even though you can kind of tell that what Darwin said kind of got to him. Well, that's the brilliance of Odette Fair. The way we wrote the script, where he says, you know, that's not my problem. These are unbeliever children, and uh, I don't care what happens to them. That's how we wrote the script. Odette Fair played it as he said that. Odette teared up. I was on set. I was like, whoa, where's this going, right? That was what we wrote, and it made it better. Because <laughs> he's saying this with such passion. I don't care about these kids. But his eyes are sparkling. He's tearing up as he's saying this. Like, okay, that's a really interesting villain. <laughs> and it's cool because at the end of the episode, uh, Farik uh, is basically like, hey, by the way, from now on, no more trafficking in underage kids. Yeah, and, and for a moment, you see Darwin, and he, he's like, oh, I got to him. There, there might be some some humanity to this guy, and then he turns around. And he's like, he's like, I didn't do that because I care about the kids. I did that because I didn't want to be in your debt for saving my life. And so, so now we're even. Mm -hmm. And like, like, you could play that both ways. We're like, yeah, is that really true, or is that his excuse, or maybe it is true? Exactly. But but it was such a like a like a sociopathic thing to, to say, where like the the villain can never actually be redeemed even to himself. And I just found that very interesting. But the thing that kind of got me the most, and, and this was in season two, yeah. you talked about Hannibal and Clarice as the father daughter, where we actually have an actual father daughter moment. And yeah, you meet his daughter. Yeah. Season two. And there's a scene where his daughter shows him these pictures that she drew and, and they're beautiful pictures. They're, they're really good. They're really talented. And whereas a normal father, would look at those and be like, oh, honey, these are great. You know, I can't believe how talented you are. And, and like be really loving and encouraging about this, the skill that his daughter has. He looks at it as a threat and he sees it as, as a, as you know, her kind of embracing some type of independence that goes beyond his control of her. And so he forces her to burn these pictures in the fireplace under the pretense that she's worship, worshiping false idols yeah, by idolatry. I mean, like there's a, even amongst the most fringe of Muslims, like, you know, we, all of us have photos, images, but the most fringe of these fanatics will say any kind of imagery is idolatry, but that's really fringe. I mean, that's, that's, that's not where Farak is, but you said it's more of his excuse to deal with what this is emotionally causing him. Yeah. Like, like you can tell that like he, he saw this as a threat to yeah. his control over his own daughter. That she her creativity was allowing her to get out of his control. Yeah. Exactly. And so, like, uh, you know, she's sitting there, she's crying as he's like like telling, giving her this and religion. He made her do it. He didn't burn them. He's like, you gotta do it. Yeah, you gotta do it. And and like, you know, you could just tell how traumatic this was mm -hmm. uh, for his daughter. And you, you know, the the scene with Oded and whoever the actress was playing his daughter was just it was heartbreaking, man. Like I had a I had a hard, easier time watching that guy getting stoned in the first episode <laughs> than I probably did watching this scene. <laughs> And it just like it, it just did a great job of just kind of illustrating like this is how a, a good villain that you love to hate operates like like he takes any threat to his own power even from someone he cares about that he could conceivably love and he has to crush it he has to be in complete control of everything and it was it's just it's so disturbing but you guys handled it like fantastically with, yeah, with this character. I've never seen anything like that since. And I was very proud of that moment. I had actually suggested it because, you know, it, it, it was a twisted version of a story. I knew of someone I'd known who had become a real, he wasn't a violent fundamentalist, but he'd become a very orthodox Muslim. Like, so he wouldn't allow himself to have photographs taken. He thought photographs were idol worship. And this person had been a brilliant painter before he'd had this change in his mindset. And so he destroyed his own paintings as sinful, which broke my heart, right? I mean, he destroyed his own creative work. And, uh, you know, and so I relayed that story of someone that I know who had gone to this level of fanaticism in his personal life. And then we then said, well, what if Farrak, you know, Farrak did that to his daughter? And we're like, wow. And that's where we took it to. And it was really, it was, when we saw it, the dailies were like, oh my God. I mean, this was incredible. And it kind of relates to an episode early on in season uh, one where uh, Darwin was kind of following this, this Muslim girl mm -hmm. who, uh, it, eventually becomes the victim of a, of a, what's it called? It's, it's like a, okay. he, he killed, the father killed her because- It was like uh, an honor killing. Honor America. killing, that's what it was, an honor yeah. killing. Yeah. And uh, when Darwin kind of brings up to Farouk, he, he's, or Far Farouk, he's just kind of like, well, you know, she shouldn't have been running around with an American guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like it's just completely justified to him and, and his, his view of like women, like how he slaps his wife, uh, you know, when, when when she's basically pleading with him not to kill himself and stuff like right. that. Um, it, it, it just kind of goes towards this uh, 
the sociopathy of the character, yeah. uh, which uh, is like a constant thread throughout both seasons of this show, which is like how sociopathic this guy really is. And, and Oded just nails for portraying that. But it, it really makes it, it, I just want to add that Oded Fair, the genius of him as an actor, is that he is a pacifist. He won't handle guns outside of the prop guns we had to use on the show. He, he was in the Israeli military. He was conscripted like all Israelis are. And, and he had some very bad personal experiences in, in Gaza that transformed him about warfare. I mean, his heart was broken by what he saw. And he left the country, and he will. And he is a passionate anti-violence, anti—you know—gun pacifist. And that's the level of actor he is that he can play that. Yeah. So one of the interesting aspects of Sleeper Cell is that it really kind of shows the trade craft of terrorists yeah. and how they're able to maintain operational security on a level that the FBI is always at a disadvantage with. Yeah, they can't penetrate it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, what I wanted to know is what kind of research went into the counter surveillance strategies that the terrorists used for the show, and how did you guys in the writer's room determine what to use and how to explain it to the audience in a way that they can understand? Well, we had the most direct research. You know, this is, uh, I still have it actually. We had the Al-Qaeda training manual. There's a training manual. Really? Yeah. So it, this was something that had been during the initial attack on Afghanistan in 2001 in the caves of Tora Bora. This was something that was found in one of the caves after they'd been abandoned. And it was essentially, the, it was written in like, you know, those old, remember those old, uh, those composition books we had as kids and it was written in those kinds of little things. And it was written in Arabic and it had been translated and by, by the State Department. And we were able to get a copy of the translation uh, of the Al-Qaeda training manual. And it was actually the training manual for how to create sleeper cells. That they were passing hand to hand. This wasn't. There's was no email stuff. They they had more. They had a better operational security than that, right? They would hand to hand pass these little composition books with all the instructions on them, right? And the, the interesting thing is the first rule of the Al Qaeda training manual. The first rule is that stay away from other Muslims. Don't go to mosques. Don't go to Islamic groups. Don't hang out with people like Cameron Pasha because they will turn you in. That's the first rule. They said is that the vast majority of majority of Muslims are brainwashed. They're into this. Islam is peace when Islam should be war, and so they will betray you because they're not into, they don't, haven't seen the truth yet. And so that's why the first rule was you had to go hang out at strip clubs, which is what the September 11th guys did. And as you remember, we, we had our, our, our villains, were, first they met in a bowling alley, and then later they were, we had the, the terrorists would meet actually in a porn store, right? Because that's a place the FBI wouldn't think of, you know, that they would go. So we had that manual, and it revealed all of these these kinds of very specific things that we put into the show about choices, but it also revealed something very troubling. Now, you know, anyone who knows the history of uh, of the Soviet war in Afghanistan is we funded a lot of these Mujahideen guys who ended up some of them ended up becoming Al Qaeda, right? You know, Osama bin Laden is one of them. He was a hero in the in the eighties who then turns against America. He was well, he was trained by Americans, and as many what and so what you when you read the Al Qaeda training manual, it's quite shocking because you'll see. These people were trained by the FBI and the CIA because they'll say, these are standard FBI surveillance techniques, and this is how you get around them. How do you know that you were being followed? Well, this is how you know that if the car does this, because they had been trained by those people in doing these things. So they're like, well, now that our, our former mentors trained us with all this stuff, let us show you how to get around it. And so we put a lot of that in there, uh, is that, you know, this was, this we had, I mean, this monster was being created on its own. We certainly added to it, you know, and gave it some operational ability, which we tried to show. Did you guys hire any uh, FBI consultants to work on the show with you? We had contact with people in the FBI. I don't recall that we had any actual official consultant. Uh, I know that we were in contact with the FBI, and uh, you know, there had there had been a Muslim who had been in the FBI, and he was actually at the time suing the FBI because he had he was Darwin. He was trained and ready to be that guy. But his supervisor like, didn't trust him. He said, I don't know this Muslim guy's agenda, so I'm not going to send him into these shady situations. And he was given a desk job. And he was basically stripped of all power. So there ended up being an HR dispute there. He's like, look, I was trained to be a field agent, but you're not letting me because I'm a Muslim guy, right? So we were in contact with all those guys. So we could talk about the prejudices with the FBI for people like Darwin, like Muslim, there are Muslim FBI agents, and some of them are not treated well. And we talked about that. Uh, you know, and so we did. We had those, uh, you know, those people that, that gave us training. The most interesting thing was after the show premiered in that December of 2005, within days we were getting calls from FBI agents who were saying, I want to thank you because you have shown the incredible bureaucratic incompetence of the bureau that I have to deal with. Because as you saw in the show, I mean, Darwin gets in trouble 50% of the time because of 
the FBI doesn't have his back because they don't know what they're doing. They're incompetent, right? Especially in season two. It's bad. And so they don't, and so we should, and they're like, this is the nonsense I have to deal with my handler. This is the nonsense that I have to deal with that allows the bad guys to get away. In, my, in the case I've worked on, I've never seen it portrayed in television because the FBI is always heroic rather than a bureaucracy, right? And we showed that. Yeah, and it, it's kind of like very similar to The Wire, which came out a couple of years before you guys in the sense that they do show that there's incompetence on the criminal and the uh, official, like yeah. cops and robbers side. Yeah. Um, and uh, that just adds some realism to the, to the story as well, because uh, I think uh, early on, maybe episode two or something like that, uh, Darwin's uh, surveillance team, whose job is to follow him around and make sure that he's safe, uh, basically messes up and gets made by Tommy, of all people, who doesn't have any training. Yeah. And uh, and uh, Darwin's basically got to salvage it, and so like you, you do see like the incompetence on kind of like both ends of things because there are terrorists that screw up as well. Yeah. Um, another aspect of the show that made it a little hard to watch, mm -hmm. if I'm being honest, is that uh, the, the terrorists associate with other criminal elements, uh, and the show kind of shows just how immoral their methods really are, mm -hmm. and how willing they are to put up with other atrocities in the name of their cause. Mm -hmm. uh, so like you have the Mexican drug cartel who's trafficking underage children, and you have the white supremacist group, yeah. uh, and both are horrific in their own ways. And it only serves to kind of showcase how terrible that the sleeper cells mission really is, that they're willing to you know, help these people profit and perpetuate their criminal acts in, yeah. advan in advancement of the cell's cause. So uh, what I wanted to ask is, why are these other criminal elements incorporated in the, into the show, and why did the writers want to showcase them? Well, the number one reason is because it, it's, it's happening. I mean, criminals tend to hang out with criminals, and revolutionaries tend to hang out with revolutionaries. I mean, if you look at some of the, some of the revolutionary groups in Europe uh, throughout the 70s, you'd have, you know, Basque revolutionaries would hang out with the PLO, right? In fact, I think even, remember Munich? They had that great scene in there where... The, uh, the Munich guys show up, they're put in a safe house, and suddenly these these PLO guys are in the same safe house. And the PLO guys pull guns on them, like, who are these guys in our safe house? And they immediately go, no, 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 we're, we're, we're Basque, we're Basque, we're not Israeli, we're Basque, right? Oh, Basque, you're with us, right? So you got these two revolutionary groups, like, and then they, they can be friends. And so that historically happens is that, you know, like attracts like, if you, if you feel that you're part, if you're a radical group of X, you know, you, who are you going to trust? You're going to trust another guy who's also against the government. You may not like them. And we had that moment with the uh, with the white supremacist, like you know, I hate you, but I hate the U.S. government more. And when I'm done with them, I'm come for you, right? And and but for now, we're just going to shake hands and trade guns and do what we got to do. That's happening historically, uh, and so that that's happened throughout history with 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 revolutionary and and insurgent groups and terrorist groups. And so we wanted to portray that, and it also made it you know it made it interesting because it showed that this is not a small world. These are not five guys in a bowling alley, they're part of a global network of people that are fed up with the world as it is and want to go turn, burn it to the ground to start over. So one of the most disturbing scenes in the show we already talked about, which was that terrorist who had, in the pilot episode was, was getting stoned by members of you know his own team. Mm -hmm. And uh, y you know I, I kind of mentioned how what you guys did was, was really crafty where mm -hmm. like they, they kind of established this guy. He's kind of like a happy go lucky dude. Yeah. Uh, he's got a family. He's got a daughter. He really cares about he invites Darwin to her birthday party in the park. Mm -hmm. And he's just yeah. kind of like, he, he seems almost harmless if he wasn't part of this like terror cell, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you guys do a really good job of not only establishing the stakes for Darwin, mm -hmm. but in that scene where, you know, he, he sees, yeah. What the consequences of his of him being undercover could be by what happens to that guy, um, but we also see the threat that Farrick and the others pose that they're willing to turn on on their own in such a brutal fashion. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to know is how do you guys, as in the writers' room and as a writer in general, properly establish the threat of death and physical violence and use it to ratchet up the tension in scenes like that? Well, the, the issue is, again, the way to do it is first you have to humanize the victim, right? And in this case, we had, you know, we had somebody who was a member of the terror team. But we cast someone, uh, Grant Hesloff, who's a, who's a great actor, and he, he, he's, 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 he's actually uh, George Clooney's partner. I mean, George Clooney's like filming partner, right? I think they have some Oscars together. And so, but Grant Hesloff, you know, he, he, and he's such a likable guy, he's sort of, you know, he's like your happy-go-lucky uncle. And so we cast the right guy for that. And then we, we really establish his humanity, 
his family, his love for his child, at her birthday party. We establish that he's a joker. He's like he's like he's the, the comedy guy in your class, where he's always making jokes. And then that guy is the one that you have to kill. And the very people, and you can tell the guys in the team like him. He's the he's the funny guy in the team. But when the moment comes, they kill him without question, right? And that that not just was, kill him. They torture the guy. They torture him. They torture him. And there's no doubt. Not one of them hesitates, right? And you see them all just, you know, twenty minutes before they're at that they're at his, uh, you know, his kid's birthday party, right? So it shows the, the the evil within them. And this character, I mean, if you'd had a really vicious guy being the one that we used in the pilot, right? It wouldn't have had the emotional impact. You have to have that guy be it. So that's that's how you establish the stakes of death. Is that somebody you end up caring for has to be the perjurer? And I think they tried to do that on Game of Thrones. In various scenes, that, that 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 little girl that was set on fire, I found that too troubling. It was too much for me, right? Like the little girl that you cared over for several seasons, and then they sacrifice her to the fire god. And it doesn't make any difference, right? I mean, it was that was a little too much for me? But uh, but but that's what you try to do. And you know, it's interesting because there is a scene where um, Darwin gets tortured uh, by by Farrick because uh, he through throughout like a series of events, his girlfriend Gail kind of goes to the uh, cops and says that she thinks that her boyfriend might be a terrorist and that kind of sets the LAPD on them and that gets back to Farik. And so like having seen that scene in the very first episode and then you see, you know, uh, Darwin start getting cattle prodded, yeah. you know, um, by, by Farik and all, all these other guys that we've come to know throughout the course of the series is kind of sitting around watching him get tortured. Um, like it, it, it's, it, makes it feel so much more tense, even though you know, like, okay, I don't think Darwin's gonna die because he's like the main character. You don't, you don't know how far it's gonna go. Are we gonna seriously maim that character? We could have, right? Exactly. And and so like, I think that like a big part, especially in, in like a, a thriller, which, which yeah. is what I would consider this show to be, uh, you need to have that threat be yeah. real. You, you need to have it be like when, when the audience is watching, it's like, oh, anyone could really die. Uh, which I, I think really helps to ratchet up the tension uh, in the show. Um, one of the techniques that the show uses very well, by the way, and this is a technique that the show Dexter later utilized expertly. And you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. And this is what I like to call the concept of the big deception. Mm -hmm. And that is basically this concept that the main character's success is entirely dependent upon maintaining a lie that is in constant danger of being exposed. Right. And in a way, this can be an even more effective way of creating tension than you know the threat of death or violence or something like that. Um, so in Sleeper Cell's case, it's Darwin's status as an undercover agent that must be continuously hidden uh, from the other characters in his story. And the characters of this, or the discovery of this deception is a constant source of tension in the series. Yeah. So what I wanted to ask you is, uh, how can writers use this technique of the big deception to add tension to their stories? And how do you figure out ways to threaten the, uh, to have the big de deception become uncovered? Because uh, it seems like in every episode, there's multiple times where like Darwin could be exposed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we said before that there's not a lot of action in, in this series in, in terms of like, you know, like gunfights and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, there is it's peppered throughout, but the, the real action comes from, okay, how does Darwin keep from getting discovered? You know, how does he maintain his cover? And, and that's the, the, the type of thing that just like makes you like tense up when you're watching the show. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the pivotal thing is you have to establish the stakes of the discovery, right? Which we did in the pilot, which is a, a perfect tortured, merciless death, right? And that, that is established. So once, once you know what the stakes of the, uh, <laughs> of the outcome is, then you're invested in the process of it. And you know, in a situation like with Darwin, it's multiple layers of, of deception. He's not just deceiving his uh, he's not just deceiving his his cellmates, right? He's also deceiving uh, his girlfriend. Like he falls in love with a woman, right? And she's uh, she's you know someone who is a civilian who doesn't know he's an FBI agent or that he's in a terror cell, right? So how do you maintain that relationship? And it it is those uh, things that we have to. Uh, create the human element of the deception of the loss of it you know in some ways the ultimate example of the undercover show was a show you may have watched when we were kids remember, remember wise guy with ken wall right nope you ever watch it? <laughs> never saw it okay wise guy's an incredible show it was it was a show back in it was, it was one of those i think it was i think it was stephen j canal one of those classic shows uh in the eight in the 80s with uh it was basically an fbi agent who 
you know, Ken Wall played an Italian American guy who infiltrates the mafia, right? Uh, and so, you know, in some ways, Supercell could be inspired by that. But, but you know, the, 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 the in that he had to hide it from his mother. And to make it more painful was, in order to keep the deception going, you know, the, like Darwin, he has to he was in prison, and so that the mob would believe that he really was a criminal, so they would bring him in. And his mother uh, ha- believed he was a criminal. He had to hide it from his mother. And his mother, his father had been someone that had fought the mafia and died. So the mother saw the son being a criminal and a mafiosa as a betrayal of the father and of the family, so she wouldn't talk to him, right? So that character, here you've got the deep emotional stakes of, it's not just that the deception is, you know that the mafia boss is gonna kill him if he finds out. It's that, how can he live his life just with his mother believing he's the bad guy? Right, and that's the pain of that show, and that, and those are that's how you make a, a, these, these deceptive things work. Is that you see the human cost of it and the burden on the character and how it can lead them to break. You know, in my studies of people that are undercover agents, they are strange people. The really good ones, I mean, they're they're like a lot of them are a little sociopathic themselves, right? I mean, they can flip personalities and they're like actors. They become that role and they don't break character. And they're they're, and you're often wondering. Do they know where the line is, right? Do they are they really that villain for the time that they're playing that role? And do they know how to get back from there? And not all of them necessarily do, right? There's a lot of psychological damage that can come from this kind of thing. So it's exploring the psychological element of the deception in, in how it affects the main character that creates the tension. And you know what's interesting about that is so like the people who do know about Darwin's great deception yeah. uh, often are questioning whether or not they should trust him. Yeah. Uh, so, like you, you know, uh, the pe- like he has to deceive the people uh, that you know he's uh, trying to put away in, in jail, and the people that he should be trusting. Uh, you know, the more they they see him do, the less trusting they become. Yeah, so the FBI like, guys don't trust him, which is based on the most, the Muslim FBI agents' complaints. Our own guys don't trust us. How can we do our job? Yeah, and and so like no matter what scene Darwin's in, there's always that tension there, which which is just part of what makes this show like so, yeah. you know, like so nail biting. I guess is is because it's like, are the FBI guys really going to have his back when the time comes down to it? Uh, you, you know, is he going to be won over to the dark side by you know the mm-hmm. philosophies of these guys that he's basically been embedded with? Yeah. And um, you know, Dexter, we we talked about that. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, that was another show that used this technique to great effect where basically, you know, a lot of the tension from that show came from like people discovering that, you know, he's actually a serial killer. And so like a lot of the the stuff that kind of um, propels the story forward in Sleeper Cell and in Dexter is, is the main character doing stuff to try to prevent from being discovered. Yeah, and, and by his loved ones. I believe it was his sister that he was trying to hide it from. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so so that that's that's you know, he doesn't want the truth of who he is to come out to the people he cares about. Yeah, and in Sleeper Cell, it's his his um, inability to um, share what's actually going on with Gail that creates problems for him because she goes to the police about yeah. her. Suspicion. That was yeah. That's in so many ways people love that 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 moment where I think it was the finale one of the episodes where she she shows up the cop. She's like, I think my boyfriend is a terrorist, and we cut to black. Right? Like, oh my god, where's this going? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, you know, what uh, to kind of keep on with. This, how to create tension in a, in a scene yeah. um, motif that we're talking about. One of the things that Sleeper Cell expertly does is that it uses reversals to create tensions with, mm-hmm. within its episodes. Yeah. And a reversal is basically when the audience is led to believe one thing, and then it's revealed that something else is actually the case. And uh, it's a very effective storytelling technique that you guys used in pretty much every episode of, of the mm-hmm. show. Yeah. Uh, like, for example, uh, that being like uh, Darwin and the FBI think that they have two days to prepare for the big attack. And then uh, Farrick reveals suddenly that the attack is set to occur in one day because Darwin was using the wrong Muslim calendar um, to you know, kind of um, figure out when the attack was going to be. Um, and every episode has like these like reversals in it. Like uh, for instance, when they were doing the, the test run on the mall where you thought there was gonna be like a anthrax attack at the mall and uh, all of a sudden like, oh wait, this was just a trial run and, yeah. and stuff like that. So you guys do that constantly in the show. And what I wanted to ask you was, um, what are your, what are the methods you use to figure out reversals to create tension in the st- in stories? Well, with, with each with each thing, you have to look at again. Always look to the ending. You look at it to what is the worst possible thing that could happen in in this moment, right? And then how do how do you surprise the audience by flipping it, right? 
And so the, the worst possible thing in that episode, the whole episode was built on we're about to have an anthrax attack. They're going. They've, they've sh- I mean, we made it real. I mean, as far as Darwin knew, it was a real anthrax attack. They all, they all had to shoot themselves up with, with Supra, which, which is meant to protect them from the anthrax, right? And the whole episode is played straight as far as Darwin or any of the team members believe. They're going to do the anthrax attack, and Darwin has no way to stop this except literally just killing all these guys barehanded. You know, and, you know that's the only way he can, and he's about to do it. Like in the scene, you, we, the thing is, when, when you get to the reversal, you've got to take it all the way to the end, right? So we got to the point where they actually are ready to pour the anthrax into the air conditioning unit of this mall and spread it throughout the mall. And Darwin, all he's got is a wrench. He doesn't even have his gun on him, and he has no way to contact his people. And so we see him actually take the wrench and get ready to bash these people over the head with a wrench. That's the only way he's going to stop a terror attack is with his wrench. And as he's lifting the wrench, getting ready to do what he has to, Farik then reaches into the bag of anthrax and touches it and does this. He's like, oh, it's really good. It was baking soda, right? And and you're like, and he's still holding this thing, which if they look for one second, they're like, Dude, why are you holding a wrench over our head, right? <laughs> I mean, so that's how far you have to take the reversal, right? You got to take the worst possible thing and take it all the way to the edge. In the episode I talked about with Scholar, right, where where you know the one I wrote, where this religious scholar tries to deprogram Christian, and we take it all the way to the point where Christian comes to the religious scholar at the end of the episode and says to him, "I have to confess something to you." I have to confess that I'm part of a, of, a, of, a, of a terror cell and that we're planning something terrible. And the scholar who was bonded with him the whole episode is so horrified. He said, well, you have to tell the police, you know, and he says, if, you know, in Islam, if you, if you save one, uh, you know, life, you save all of mankind. If you kill one life, you killed all of mankind. And so and he embraces him. So we take it as far as that. It's like, wow, Christian has revealed the plot to this guy. It's over. He's embracing him. And as he embraces him, we take it to that, Christian pulls out this, this syringe of poison and kills him. So you've got to take it all the way. That's how you build the tension. You take it all the way to you're like, oh, wow, okay, they're doing this. They're, oh, they're not doing this. That's the only way it works. Did you guys in the writer's room sit down and be like, okay, we have to have a minimum of like three reversals per episode or anything no, like that? that? It's just natural storytelling because – the show required it. I mean, we had to keep the show going, right? If we if we could suddenly have an anthrax attack in, in like episode two, where, where, where are we going to go from there, right? So, but in order, because the audience also knows if we have an anthrax attack in episode two, where we go from there, the only way the audience is going to buy it is if we take it all the way, right? You have to actually believe it's going to happen. So the audience goes, oh, shoot, they're, they're actually going to do it. They're going to they're, they're do it. Oh, they didn't do it. Oh, I didn't see that. Wow. Okay. But if you have any hesitation of taking it all the way, the audience isn't going to buy it. Yeah, so moral of the story is if you're doing a reversal, the audience has to believe that it's going to happen. Yeah. And then at the last minute, you change it. And that change yeah, also there's has the release. To there's too. the release. Yeah. And, and the audience will thank you for that because, you know, they need the release. You know, it's, it's, it's like Hitchcock said, the scare, the scare is not the, uh, the, the scare is not the boo. The scare is the lead up to the boo, right? Yeah, and it's the it's boo. not the bomb exploding. It's you watching the clock tick down on the yeah. bomb. It's actually when the monster appears is actually the moment the audience says, oh, thank God I can breathe. They scream. That's the breath, right, coming out. But the whole tension of when is Michael Myers or Jason or Freddy going to appear is the scare. Yeah, so uh, threat of discovery for the big lie, lots of good reversals, um, like well-crafted, you know, milestones for the, the different story things. These are all things that help add, you know, build good tension uh, within a, a story. Uh, one of the things, though, that adds some good tension is that um, good stories aren't afraid to kill off some of its characters. Sure. And Sleeper yeah. Cell was not shy about killing off characters. Uh, in particular, what struck me in my rewatch, because I had totally forgotten about this, was the death of Special Agent Ray Fuller, who's Darwin's handler for, throughout the bulk of the season. And that was like kind of a real shocking twist, and because uh, like you just didn't see the death coming. It was, it was yeah. very wild. He slit his throat. Yeah, it was. It was the, the teenage boy, I believe, that was from Afghanistan, right? That you had come to care about. That he kills one of our heroes. So yeah, yeah. And it was it was a, a kid that Darwin was desperately trying to save and, and keep from going down the radical path. Uh, but this death allowed for a new element of the show where Darwin was forced to deal with a new case agent that he didn't fully trust, and that was the character of Agent Serksner, yeah. uh, played by a woman. Um, but th- this almost felt like the writers, like, like when I was watching it, the writers 
I mean, like maybe you can speak to this because in my mind, um, I felt like you you guys knew that there was kind of a lack of tension in the in Fuller and Darwin's relationship, where it just felt like Fuller had his back far too much. Like like there wasn't any like real um, tension there, and it almost felt like his death was kind of a late season course correction to help ratchet up the tension going into the final episodes. Um, because all of a sudden, Serksner doesn't have his back, and she's new, and she's kind of hard nosed, and Darwin doesn't fully trust her. Um, and you, you know, maybe you guys had this planned out from the beginning, but it kind of felt like almost like, oh, we, we kind of made a mistake. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Also, I wasn't in the, the decision call when it was I – because mean, it's always the most difficult thing when you sit down with the actor and say, we're going to let you go, right? You're firing someone, right? You're taking away their livelihood. They're, I mean, so someone who thought they might have more episodes in their contract, you're like, okay. It's, so I wasn't in that call, you know, and so I, I don't know ultimately the decision-making. Uh, we were just told we're going we're gonna to move on from that, and the actor is wonderful, and I know that Ethan Osiris loved him so I, we were never really told the reasoning for that uh i definitely think that the that it created a new dynamic after his character was gone the first thing it did is showed that anyone can die on the show our heroes can die right and that that's a pivotal thing that's important to keep us emotionally invested in this as you know other especially by season two other major characters that are heroes are dead right and that really hits you but we established that we needed to show on a show like this that you know you can't get invested in these people any of these people that you care about could die and so that was definitely the storytelling element of it when agent surfster comes in we have this great thing is that the plot is now deep the show is deep into the plot's just a couple of episodes away and suddenly you have the drama of a new handler coming in who doesn't who has no relationship with darwin right and a very different personality between them and you know and you know she's trying to establish she's a woman and she's wants to be respected by this man and, and you know so suddenly you have that hard-nosed element coming in where you know it, they can't have the collegiality necessarily because she's trying to make sure he respects her authority and and the clock is ticking there's only a couple more episodes and the, and the attack is happening so how do you do that i think there are three more episodes uh, right. by the time she comes in yeah. and so but it's but it's near the end of the season so when you see that happening like what do you do now without his handler what's how he's how is he going to be he doesn't have the resources of the fbi uh, to, or somebody trusts in the FBI to solve this thing that's coming. And so that was definitely the major story issue that came out of that is creating chaos for him. Because, you know, you, you think about it, you're expecting that he's going to defeat the villains. So you've got to make that as really hard as possible, right? Uh, it's, a, it's like in Star Wars, in Star Wars, you know, people weren't expecting, you know, Ben Kenobi to get killed, right? They were like, you know, oh my God. And then they weren't expecting his voice to start coming from beyond the grave. And you're like, whoa, that's a whole other thing. The Force does that, and then away we went, right? And so that's what you had to do. And, and if you think about the same way with Star Wars, that happened at the end of Act 2 of the movie, is Ben Kenobi getting killed. And this was essentially the end of Act 2 of our show. And I do know that we thought in terms of acts. I think we had divided the 10 episodes into Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3. And that was really the end of Act 2. Is, is the worst possible situation our hero could be in. The attack is happening. He doesn't know the details of it. He doesn't know how to stop it. And the only person he's come to trust is dead. So how is he How is he going to be able to defeat the situation? And he almost doesn't. Because and of those. and it, it was kind of poetic in the sense of how Fuller died. Well, first of all, I, I want to point out that you guys spent a lot of time kind of showing us his family life. So like we got to see his wife, we got to see his kids got to see him outside and we also got to see him go to bat for darwin time and time again so there was a lot of goodwill built up for this character and so like when he gets his throat slit it's it's all that more shocking we're like oh my god like you know like this was a good guy i can't believe this happened to him so you, you know again going back to how you guys killed off the that terrorist in the pilot episode this was another like kind of one where like you, you really made the audience care about the character and then yeah. you, you killed him off um but the the, the really big thing I wanted to ask you about was, was how do you determine, mm -hmm. like, when to, when's the right time to kill off a character and who to kill off? Like, you know, what what is it going to make the most impact on the story when a character dies? Well, it, it's, you know, some, sometimes it, you know, there have been times, I will say this, on other shows I've worked on, there have been times when it's time to let a character go because you're not getting along with the actor, right? And that happens a lot. Uh, you know, you know, and so that can sometimes be a factor. It has nothing to do with story. It's all about this ain't working. And, you know, I don't know. How, and I don't think recasting this character is going to work. So we just got to get rid of them. You know, and soap operas do that all the time. You know, the character dies in a plane crash and then two years later he comes back as his twin brother or whatever. So, you know, that kind of thing. So sometimes it's as, it's as simple and unfortunate as that. Uh, you know, but in our show, I think 
in a show where you're trying to plan out this idea of surprise and about taking things to the edge before you have a reversal, you have to use death as one of the major elements of getting it to that point where you're thinking, oh, they're actually going to go that far. I mean, ultimately, the show has a reversal. Darwin is able, at least in season one, to defeat the villains. And, uh, and so you have to take it as far as possible that he was going to lose and for killing a major character uh, to make that seem as a realistic outcome was, uh, was part of that. And I think that, that weighs in a lot of decisions as to when you should kill a dead character is if it's actually going to bring the emotional punch to the audience, especially if it is truly unexpected. I mean, I think the genius of the first season of Game of Thrones is that Ned Stark dies in the penultimate episode, which I didn't see coming when I saw that, right? And I was shocked by it because, because he was the only actor I'd ever heard of. Right? And you're like, this guy. But of course, the master of that, the master of that is obviously Alfred Hitchcock, where Psycho, where you think the movie is about Vivian Lee, who is a major, you know, not Vivian Lee, I'm sorry, you know, but, but the movie, you got a character, and she's a major actress, right? And uh, and so uh, suddenly you have these, she's killed off, right, in the, in the shower scene, right? And uh, you're like, well, who, who are the rest of the people? In this What's the movie about? The star's dead. And you realize it's about these other character actors who were very good, right? Right. And uh, and so uh, so yeah. So that so that's the genius of it is is that you have to know when it will have the emotional punch, and then you have to have something to to go after that because in, in Psycho you had characters you cared about after you know the main actress is dead, right? And the same thing with our show, we, we had compelling cast every time we killed off someone. We had compelling cast to replace them, uh, you know. As you know, even Sorcerer also meets an end, right? And so, and then, and then we we go from. It's interesting with Darwin's handlers is we go from someone that he grudgingly comes to respect, or for first he has a, has a has a lot of mistrust with him, then comes to actually really respect. Then with Sorcerer, it's a lot of hostility, and then a great deal of admiration by the end. And then he then replaced ultimately by someone that represents the FBI bureaucracy, who's Darwin sees as an incompetent buffoon, and that's actually the the major guy is going to deal with for the rest of the second season, right? So, yeah, and it was interesting because so Sonia Walger, is well, that Walger, yeah, she great. So actor. she she's the one who plays Patrice Serkner, and I'd only ever seen her in like romantic comedies yeah. up until uh, this role, so it was kind of interesting to see her take on kind of like the hard nosed FBI chick. Mm -hmm. um, but the the death of um, of Agent Fuller happened right at you know, as you said, the end of act two. And so like going into the finale where mm -hmm. where Darwin would need him the most, you guys, the writers deny him, deny that character, that that security and, and that, that support. And so like, uh, you know, in any good kind of story, but it's particularly in thrillers, yeah. you always need to ratchet up the obstacles in, in, as you get closer to the climax. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last three episodes of, of this show, uh, you guys are just throwing everything at poor Darwin. Like, yeah. like, it's just like, yeah. Like, like, stop this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I also thought it was kind of interesting how when Fuller died, he died because he was betraying Darwin. Uh, he was taking this kid and he basically, within a couple sentences about how he was going to go back to get Mo and stuff like that, like, like Fuller turned into the epitome of what these radicals thought. Uh, America was. Yeah. And in a way, like it was that reversion uh, to that kind of stereotypical yeah. evil American that did him in. Because if he had just shown a little bit of compassion to this kid like Darwin was, the kid probably wouldn't have felt the need to kill him, you know, in yeah, order and, to escape. And, and that's, and that, I mean, that deals with the, a, a theme that we wanted to explore, which is look, you know, a lot, there were a lot of things that happened, especially in the Iraq War. We saw a lot of the torture stuff come out with the soldiers. These are people that wouldn't have imagined they would have done those things, right? They're decent people that were put into an extreme situation, and then suddenly they're they're torturing, you know, detainees and whatever, and you get Guantanamo and all that. And I, I actually worked on a Guantanamo show with Oliver Stone that, that never made it to air, so I got to look into that world. And these are people that you would not imagine. And so we wanted to explore what this war on terror can do to good people, you know, just the fear. I mean, look, the world we're in right now, look at me, the world that we're in right now, there's a great deal of fear. That's the defining element of it, right? There's terror everywhere. People are afraid to go out of their houses. They're afraid to be around their loved ones. And it's turning a lot of people I know into something that I don't recognize anymore. Uh, and so we want to explore on Sleeper Cell that element of 
you know, once you give in to your own darker side, you and you can destroy yourself, even as the hero. You know, and that's something that Darwin is constantly facing. The only way for that to have an emotional impact is for us to actually see it happen to someone. And and again, it, it's stuff like that which kind of elevates the writing of, of yep. this show, in my opinion, because you wouldn't yep. think that a poetic thing like that, where symbolically this guy regresses into the epitome of what the terrorists are fighting against, and that's what his ultimate undoing is. Mm -hmm. Like as a casual viewer, like you don't even think about that stuff, but on some level it resonates, and especially someone like me who is a writer and studies the craft and stuff like that. And I see something like that. I'm like, oh, wow, the people writing this really know what they're doing. Uh, so like that, that to me, like just, you know, just makes the show so much more enjoyable when there's like that aspect to it. You know what I mean? Well, in second season, there was, there was a moment that I think a lot of the audience, like I said, they love to hate Farrakh. I mean, they, they thought he was a sociopathic, charismatic, you know, love to hate this guy, right? Because you can't stop watching him on screen. And then he's captured and he's actually sent to Saudi Arabia to be tortured, right? And the torture scenes were pretty horrific. I mean, you saw them. They're pretty horrific. And actually, the genius of the director of that episode, when he directed the final scene where, where Farrakh is about essentially to break and give up what he knows because he's been so horrifically. And we, just, and we don't show all of it, but we describe it pretty intensely, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he's actually tied up in a way that's almost like a cross. Christ-like, Christ -like, yeah. 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 And that wasn't what we had written, but the director visually saw it that way. And by the end, when Farrakh is about to break, this guy that you've seen – murder people without any empathy for you know 15 episodes so far right and he he's about to break and odette fair played him as crying and breaking down you know from all the pain he's suffering in you're feeling sorry for this guy and it's the american standing there going i want you to talk when you to talk and then you know it goes badly the rest of that scene you know because again by the lesson there is once we become the very thing that that could actually make someone like that sympathetic you feel sorry for him You've lost your moral authority, and the cosmos can balance it. And then terrible things happen to those torturers because of that, right? And so that's the complexity of the show. Yeah, and I actually want to dive a little bit deeper into that scene that you were talking about when we get into season two. But I want to wrap up with season one with two more things. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is you kind of mentioned before, like when you talked about how when uh, when uh, Gail went to the police and she's yeah. like, I think my boyfriend's a terrorist, and then boom, cut to black. You guys do a lot of that stuff uh, on this show where like you end it on a, a cliffhanger or some type of revelation that has far reaching effects on the story. Like the final shot in the pilot was uh, Darwin talking to uh, his case agent. So he just says, I'm in. And then he yeah. just like hangs up. And then the look on his face where he's, he's like, what did I get into? Yeah. And then they're like, boom, cut to black. And uh, like every episode in the show, like, tends to end on some type of like shocking revelation or cliffhanger. And it's a good way to hook the audience into wanting to see what happens next in the story. It's kind of the same way when you're writing a novel, you want to end the chapter on something that's going to want to keep yeah. people keep reading. Yeah. Uh, so what's some advice you can give to create effective end of episode hooks that can entice the audience to want to return for the next episode? Well, the, the most important thing is I think you have to fully settle the problem of the episode first. You have to you have to solve that. You've got to get rid of all the, the threads and make it feel like you've resolved. It's you know it's the it's the episode of the week, right? And then once you've satisfied the audience that it's over, that's when you can hit them with a punch that there's more to come, right? And that that you have to do that. If you you know ineffective versions of that is where you don't actually solve the story. You think the cliffhanger is you know I was supposed to reveal who the murderer was, but I'm not going to. Uh, you know, that's not going to make the audience fulfilled. That's going to make the audience feel it was cheated out of what it wanted, and it's not going to come back for the next episode, right? And so that's what you have to do. Uh, and so however, you, however you, you punch out with a surprise, it has to be because people think the show's over. I mean, using a perfect example from horror movies, because I love horror movies, uh, Friday the 13th did that very effectively in both the first and the second movies, being a little of a trope for the rap, you know, in those movies, where in the Friday the 13th, you know, she, in the very first movie, she, she ends up killing the woman that's been killing everybody in, in, on, in, in Camp Crystal Lake. And she's finally, you think, the, you think the, you know, the movie's over. She's on a lake alone where she's safe. And then the body of Jason jumps out of the water, who's not actually a character in the movie. He's just references the boy who died in the lake. And suddenly this corpse of Jason comes out and grabs her, right? I didn't see that coming. And you know, Carrie, the same thing. The movie's over. Carrie's dead. You know, Carrie's grave, her hand comes shooting out of the grave, right? So that's how you do it. You fulfill the audience's expectations and then you shock them. And then that'll help you bring them up for the next episode. 
So That's you can you complete the story arc that was started at the beginning of the episode, and then right before the episode ends, you almost introduce a new story element, and the audience is like, "Oh, I want to see what happens with that thread, exactly. that story thread for exactly. the next episode." You know, a, a brilliant one that was done for a season ending was the original, the first season of Alias. You know, the whole season is is about her being a back like when JJ Abrams was doing good work. Yeah, <laughs> when, when he when he didn't farm it out to the rest he of the actually cared about his stories. <laughs> Yeah, I enjoyed Alias, and then, I, I love the first like two seasons of Alias, and then yeah. it just kind of like yeah. But but oh. the ending of Alias, the first season, the genius of it is you had this whole season of her, and it's all about her relationship with her dad, and and you know, and and the uh, and the other people in in her like you know her, her intelligence group or whatever, and and all that. And the final season, is she's being you know final episode of the season, the final scene is she's being tortured, and she's alone, she's left in the dark, and a figure comes in to the shadows. And you've established that her mother died a long time ago, right? And a figure comes in from the shadows, and she looks up, and she goes, Mom? And you're out, right? <laughs> okay? And then, you're like, her mom's alive? <laughs> you know, wait a minute. And, we're, and her mom apparently is working with the bad guys who are torturing her, right? And boom. I'm like, I'm going to watch the second season. That, yeah. But the whole arc of that first season had been fulfilled. So the, if you, the show just ended there, you'd have had a good show. And then suddenly you're like, oh, I'm watching now. And you know another show that was really good at that was Lost. Like every at the end of every episode of Lost, there was always this moment that they introduced where you were just like, "Oh my god!" I well, that's wait. what they make it up as they go along. So yeah. <laughs> you, the only way you could get people to watch it was you had to shock them because yeah. there, there was no threat. And so, I, I was one of those who drank the Kool Aid. I was convinced that they yeah. had a plan uh, up until like the very final season. And at which point, when I start watching season six or whatever it was, I was like, "Oh." They don't know what they're doing. Oh, <laughs> they don't no, know how to get this in there. From season one, from my friends like uh, who were who, like involved in the show, like, nah, they're just making up as they go along. They were stocked that they got to pick up. Now, what do they do? <laughs> <laughs> they had no plan for. They didn't have a plan for season one, much less six seasons. <laughs> they didn't know what the island was about. They had no idea what was really happening with the polar bear. It was just like, hey, let's throw some stuff in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I wanted to just ask you, uh, you know, as a personal aside, what do you think of mystery boxes? What do you think of the whole concept of that? You know, again, I, I think that a mystery box only works if you know what's in the box. I think lazy screenwriting is when you do the mystery box because you're like somebody else is, you know, which I think Mr. Abrams has been accused of, perhaps not unfairly, of setting up a box and you solve it. I'm out of here, right? And that's not good storytelling. You know, I know when I plot out, I'm working on a pilot right now. I think I mentioned another podcast about the, about the Ottoman Empire. I've, plot, I've written the pilot. I've plotted out the entire first season and I've plotted out the entire five season arc of the show. Right. I know I don't necessarily know every single episode of those five seasons, but I know at the end of every season where the main character is going to end up, you know, in this and what the problem is going to be. So other people will think, wow, you set up a great mystery box at the end of season one. Right. Uh, I know what's in that box. I, only, I know what's in five boxes down the line. And that's why I'm so confident about it. Yeah. I mean, that's how I planned out my series when uh, my book series when I was working on TV shows. Yeah. That's how I plotted out, you know, the the series Bible, you know, like I'd have like multiple seasons kind of planned out and you, you would think that, that would be standard practice, but apparently. Uh, no, it's, you know. it's not. I mean, you know, I think I think people like us, I, I'm guessing you were self-taught. I was self-taught, right? In some well, way. I went to film school, but okay. uh, you know, a lot of a lot of what I know came from personal study, diving deeper into stuff outside of class. Exactly. And uh, and you know and and from what I gather, you didn't come into Hollywood with a big personal network, right? And mm -hmm. so your success came from whatever you were creating. You know, and uh, similar for me, I think a lot of people in this industry, you know, as you know, the most powerful people in this industry are those with a personal network, right? Those who have you know, Mr. Abrams, talented guy as he is, came from a very established Hollywood family, right? And and there's there's those networks perpetuate. Uh, and so as a result of that, I think when you have a network, you less you you are not as motivated to learn craft, you just don't because your success is already being given to you. People like us have to learn craft because we got no other way to get anybody's attention. Well, we also hold ourselves to a certain standard. I would love to do that. Uh, one of the episodes that you wrote in the first season that you specifically wrote, you know, mm -hmm. it's called Scholar. We've talked about it um, yeah. off and on throughout this conversation. Yeah. Uh, it has a subplot about a visiting uh, professor or imam. I, I don't want to mischaracterize him. Yeah. Uh, but he teaches a more peaceful form of Islam and a direct challenge to those who've been radicalized. Yeah. 
And uh, it's kind of funny because the way the episode starts, at first you kind of think that he might be kind of like, ooh, like, like he might be another one of these radicals just pretending to... Yeah, he's, just, he's like, you know, what, what people always accuse us Muslims of, we're hiding our true face. And that's, yeah. how, that's how it's presented. Maybe that's what, what he's doing. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's also the episode that really illustrates the philosophical divide with Islam between the radicals and the moderates. And it conveys the message that the war on terror is more of a philosophical war at its core. Yeah. It, it's kind of a war for the heart of Islam. And in order to actually win it, it must be fought with ideas and compassion as opposed to guns and bombs. And that was kind of like Darwin's big takeaway at the end of this, uh, the episode that you wrote, where he's like, you know, like, we need people like this professor if we're ever going to win this war. Um, so what I wanted to ask you, since you were the kind of the, the mastermind behind this episode, what can you tell us about that theme? Uh, and how the writers chose to weave and highlight it into like the series as a whole, because it wasn't just relegated to this one episode, it kind of permeated throughout the rest of the series. And do you think that there is a right way to integrate thematic messages into the story and a wrong way to do it? Sure. Well, you know, that theme, well, like I said, that theme was was born, I think, when when Ethan Reeve and Cyrus Forrest watched Muhammad Ali, you know, someone that they deeply admired and most Americans admire. And, and he's like, well, I'm a Muslim and I'm not responsible for what these guys did. My religion is responsible, right? So, like, okay, well, that's a conversation that's worth exploring, right? Okay. Uh, and so that theme was, was, was seated throughout, you know, this episode, it's interesting because, you know, some people, as my critics will say, you are just an Islamist propagandist. The character in in that particular episode is actually based on a real person like all the characters were there's and there it was based on a yemeni uh islamic scholar named el hitar who would go into prison cells and in yemen and deprogram al-qaeda terrorists they said these guys are cult followers they don't they've been they're, they're members of a cult they need to be deprogrammed and uh, and then and then uh, mi6 actually worked with him and he was used in britain to deprogram uh, british radicals uh the fbi and the cia refused to work with him whatever but he was he was someone that, that he was based on so that that that's that's the the real thing so because it's a real phenomenon that's happening in this issue it had to be addressed throughout but you know looking at the broader trip theme and we talked about this with when we talked about some of the current discussion around storytelling especially this new generation of of subversion storytelling where people seem to think that theme itself is story it's not you know if the theme is is the uh is the these this you know it's like the the cream that you're putting into the soup, right? But it's not the soup, right? It, it puts the flavor into it, but you have to have the soup. You have to have the rest of it. And it establishes the direction and the point of view of the characters. But when theme is not used for the purpose of exploring the points of view of the characters and the lessons they're learning, it, it becomes not theme, but it becomes uh, teaching. It becomes preaching. Me messaging, yeah. Messaging. And that's not storytelling. You know, the greatest stories, I mean, I think the stories come out of the Bible, all have incredible messages, but they're great stories that, that pull you in and you get the message out of them. And so we, we're at a place right now in, in the industry in Hollywood where you have a generation of people that, that believe that they are there to virtue signal, that the purpose of storytelling is to, is to share philosophical ideas and be accepted by their colleagues for having said the right things. Uh, rather than telling compelling story. And because of this, the problem with that kind of, you know, false understanding of theme and its relationship to story is that as a result, you get bad characters because characters do not get to grow and change when confronted with the issues of the theme. And I think one of, you know, one of the critiques that I have of The Last Jedi is, you know, people like Admiral Holdo could have been an interesting character, but she ends up just becoming this person lecturing because that's the theme, they're hectoring. You know, fly boy, listen to me. I am the boss. You don't know. And so they're actually giving the point of whatever the theme that this gentleman was thinking of and using it. And if that was good storytelling, you'd have Admiral Holdo making that comment and you discover that she's actually a spy working for the, uh, the evil forces, right? And then, which is what the, the good guys suspect. But in fact, just have a linear story where they don't like what she says, they rebel against her, and they're proven wrong. So there's no journey because... The journey was accomplished the moment the character said the moral lesson they wanted to impart. So you're left with a flat story. So that's the problem with with this misunderstanding of theme in current storytelling. Yeah, I, I like how you um, kind of use that metaphor of theme is meant to uh, add flavor. It's not meant to be the main course, you know. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, you know, in film school, we always called it the spine. Like there, yeah. there, the theme is the spine of the, the story, but um, you, you know, you build the meat. Yeah, proper the flesh and the blood around it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I want to start talking about season two. Yeah. You know, season two of Splinter Cell because we've we've covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover in season one, yeah. and I was going to take you to task for something. So go ahead. I mean, I, I mean, I have some criticism of season two too, so, so it's okay. I, I was going to say, as I was rewatching season two, it was I was going to ding you on how unrealistic it was that any guy would have a hard time being in an arranged marriage with Sarah Shahi. Okay. Uh, but then you guys were like, "Oh wait, he's gay," and then I was like, "Oh okay." Now I can't ding him on that. Well, and the <laughs> character and and the character had been imagined to be that. You know, we we had we wanted to explore the issue again based on real people of some people within the Muslim community that you know had joined radical forces, and you discover they're actually running away from personal psychological trauma, such as you know being closeted gay and being unable to deal with it. And there are there are actual characters that are people that have been captured in radical groups that have these kinds of issues. And so we want to portray that as a, as a, a real thing, uh, which was very controversial for the Muslim community. The Muslim community had, on one level, they loved, you know, season one, they loved the fact that I was there and I was fighting for presenting what most of us Muslims think is normative Islam and being a voice for that. But there was a lot of sex scenes. Our main character, the religious Muslim guy, is having sex outside of marriage. So a lot of Muslims criticized me for that, right? When they got to season two and one of the characters is gay and are having gay sex scenes, right? Uh, they, 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 that was really hard for a lot of conservative Muslims to watch, right? Uh, but again, you have to explore reality, which is one of the lessons is that whatever one's philosophical beliefs are about the universe, the characters don't have to share your belief. And you have to be honest to the characters and see the world from their point of view. And you don't, have, you know, whether you like what they do or they don't do is irrelevant. You just have to be truthful to them. So, yeah. So, that, and so second season was a darker season, as you saw. Uh, and, you know, it was also we, we wanted to flip expectations because, you know, what, what do you do when you've already spent a whole season with Darwin being a member of a sleeper cell trying to keep his cover? So it's called sleeper cell. So there's going to be more sleeper cells and Darwin's going to have to be in them. Right. So how do you make that fresh? And so what we did was we put him in the impossible situation of being promoted to the head of the local cell. So now he's got a bunch of followers who expect him to come up with a terror plan. And the reason he's not just turning them all in as, and arresting them is that he discovers there's a network of other terror cells, and the only way he's going to find out what's going on is he's got to pretend to be the leader of this one. So how does how does he balance this impossible situation and give these guys tasks so that his followers think he's the he's far and he's the the badass you know terrorist leader while not actually getting them to kill anybody? And you know that's an it was an impossible situation. We want to explore it. Well, you know, uh, I wanted to ask you, so obviously Michael Ely, this was the first thing I'd ever seen him, and he's yeah. since gone on to do some really good work in other shows and stuff. Yeah. Um, was there ever a discussion to make this more of an anthology thing where you bring in like a new undercover and like a new sleeper cell as opposed to carrying on with the characters? I, I, I think, yeah, I think had the show continued i remember some conversations with even inside talking about the possibility of of you know of darwin becoming essentially the fuller role becoming the handler and, and a new young muslim coming in season three who would be the guy that darwin would try to mentor but the guy's not listening to him and his experience right or maybe it would have been a woman i don't know but it would be someone else and then the tension of darwin who's been through this and knows how to handle it versus the young gun that's not obeying him right I think that's where they might have wanted to go. I recall those conversations, but we didn't get a second season. And one of the criticisms people have said is, well, that was a really dark season. You did essentially the, the terror attack goes off. It works. It kills a lot of people. And then Darwin appears to be defeated by Farrakh at the end of season, at the end of season. And, you know, you're not clear whether he's dead or not. He's lying on the ground. <laughs> you don't know if he's dead. And so people said, that's a really dark ending for this series. And well, it wasn't meant to be the ending. I think, it was supposed to be the Empire Strikes Back episode. Yeah, I always got the sense that you guys were fully confident that you were going to get a third season, then Showtime was just like, nope. Yep, and, uh, you know. And it's the audience who suffers, because I remember watching that final episode back when it first aired in 2006, and I was like, I was like, oh, man, I can't wait to see what happens next. And then I read, like, oh, it's not coming back. And I'm just like, 
dude, you know, at least yeah. give us like a, a movie to wrap things up with or something. Well, and it's gotten worse. I mean, that's, look, I can't believe Showtime has its own economics and has to figure out what it wants to do. And it was beyond our control. It was disappointing. Uh, but the, but it's becoming more and more commonplace. And it's actually a big problem on Netflix shows because Netflix will throw a hundred million dollars on a show and pull it after one season. And or so, two or two yeah. seasons, or, you know, you might get, you might get you know, like Marco Polo. I know I have friends that worked on the never seen episode season three of Marco Polo that was never filmed. And it, from what they told me, it would have been incredible. There's an entire episode of, of essentially Kublai Khan's plans to invade Japan. And the, and the finale of that season would have been the historical event where he invaded Japan with thousands of ships and a massive typhoon destroyed all of his ships. And so you'd have basically all the Marco Polo's people like in the ocean trying to survive. And there's like thousands of samurai standing on the beach of, you know, of, of Japan waiting for them, right? And you're like, wow, but we never got to see it. Yeah, Stars, the Stars Network also does that a lot where they'll give like a show two seasons and then all of a sudden they'll just, just cancel it. And, and so that's the danger. I mean, as I plan my own shows going forward, you know, you know, like this Ottoman show I'm working on right now, I got a plan. I mean, if they pull it for a season, I'm not going to be able to tell the whole story. I want to because I've got a plan that takes these characters actually over decades of their lives, right? Uh, it might actually be like the crown where we might have to recast as we the characters get much older over the time period but you know that's why the goal is to try to give as much at this point just make a, as fulfilling a season as you can because you got to assume that that's all you've got so was there was the second season of sleeper cell always planned or um you know was it greenlit only after the first season had such a claim because the first season it felt like it ended in such a way where like it that could have been the end and they didn't need to make a second season. So I'm just curious, how did season two come about? Was it always kind of in the pipeline or was it something that you guys were surprised with when Showtime came back and said, we want to do more? Well, all of us wanted the show to continue. Um, you know, I don't recall that they were, at least with the writers, Ethan and Cy revealed their plans for season two until we were called back into the room, uh, you know, months later and like, oh, season two has become your ongoing that you have a job, come back. And we came back and, and then they, and I think in that time frame they had fleshed out that they wanted to do a Darwin as the head of the cell and, you know, you know, far as, uh, you know, on the run and being captured and all that stuff. And, so I think they had that plan. I don't know that it existed in very much detail prior to the hiatus between seasons. I think it really came together in between. I could be wrong, but uh, but we were presented with it at that at that point. So yeah, I mean, they probably wisely set up season one that if we don't have anything else, we'll end up on with a great one season miniseries that has an impact. And then we were all delighted to have a second season. And so we decided to experiment and try some stuff only to be crushed when we were, the experimentation was left unfulfilled. So, um, you know, you kind of talk, uh, I remember on Twitter, you, you kind of, yeah. met, like when I first brought up see, how I didn't like how season two ended, you were like, well, we always kind of envisioned it as the empire strikes back of, of yeah. the show where, you know, the second season is where like, you know, the bad guys kind of come out on yeah. top. Um, can you take us through the process of plotting out season two and how you guys came up with the story and how you planned out the starter I mean, season? It, 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 was, it was similar in the sense that, you know, the same grid existed. We put out the episodes. I think, I think there were eight episodes. I, will, I, don't, I forget. I don't recall the exact number of episodes. We played out the episodes and then the characters, and we knew who these characters were. We wanted to explore other people, again, all based on real people that existed in the jihadi world. You know, one of the most interesting characters for me was a character of Mina, played by Tekla Royton. Right, who's uh, he's essentially played? I think it was a Danish character, but he was a character in Northern Europe who had married uh, a radical her, her, who had been killed in Iraq, and now she was coming back for revenge. And so that was really for me that she was the heart of the of the show for that second season. Her journey, she's the one that pulled off the terror attack at the end of the, at the end of the season. So we we lay that out, and I think you know there was you know we I don't recall exactly what because I think you can see that. I think you even commented this to me earlier that it feels like the, the show ended in the penultimate episode like Game of Thrones does, right? When the terror attack happens and then, and then suddenly now we've got another season, another episode, which felt like it was setting up another season, right? So I think we had really invested a lot of our time breaking the show up to the major terror attack, which was the penultimate, the episode before the finale. And then we ha we're setting up in the finale the structure for something else that was never allowed to build. Okay, that, that's interesting. Like, I know that was there a lot of discussion where you guys kind of sat down and said, like, we want to go darker with this season. We want the bad guys to be more formidable and actually maybe 
uh, get a few victories here. I, I, I just want to know what the thought process was for going in, in this new direction. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely that conversation. I mean, because again, you want to give the audience more than it's already gotten, you know, and if it's just another season of, of him taking on the bad guys and winning with, you know, it wasn't doing ease in the first season, but he won. We wanted to explore when things go out of control because it's a world that nobody can control. And we wanted to surprise people. Again, we didn't want to subvert them. We wanted to surprise them. And, uh, and show, and in the very first, you know, I think it was in the pilot that we ended up killing his handler, right? And again, in a really horrific way. And so you're like, okay, this, they're, 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 they're going all in from the, the first, from, from the get go and where is this going to go? Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the goal was to explore both dark in the sense of violence and, and dark in the sense of the psychological darkness of the characters. You know, you have the self hating gay terrorist, you've got this lovely white woman who is, fanatically the most dangerous member of the group, right? And so, uh, you know, we wanted to explore those those pathologies. Was there any uh, talk about, you know, with the character of Mina, um, you know, yeah. making uh, it specifically a woman who is going to be the, like the biggest threat throughout the season? Because it, it's kind of interesting how the show went because you get the new leader of the cell who I, yeah. I forget the name yeah. of the actor who played him, but he, in a way he, he's more competent than Ferret because he figures out that uh, Darwin's an FBI agent, like yeah. right from the get go pretty much. Yeah. Uh, but Darwin kills him mm -hmm. and then he's kind of promoted to the cell. And then we get to see the different aspects of the cell where you got the gang member, uh, Benny, you got yeah. the, the gay uh, Muslim uh, Salim, and then you got Mina who, um, you, you know, throughout the course of the show, at first she's kind of sympathetic because of what happens to her during her day job where basically the, the guy that the husband of the woman she yeah. works for rapes her. Yeah. But then like you, like as the show goes on, she just becomes like so terrible. Like uh, you find out that, you, you know, she was going into a war zone pregnant and because like, you know, of a, of a missile strike, she loses the baby and she blames America. And you're like, you're like, bitch, what were you doing going into a war zone with a <laughs> nine months pregnant? I mean, that's great. Because, you know, again, she's based on real women. You know, there was, a, at this time period, I mean, this is 2005, 2006, at the Iraq war is raging. There's no end in sight. And there's all this stuff happening. And what's happening now is, uh, is which we wanted to show the evolution of the strategy of the adversary, which is, you know, they didn't want, you know, they don't want people like me, like Cameron Pasha, who can be profiled in the, in the they wanted in the, they wanted Europeans, in particular, to be joined, white Europeans to join them. That was happening at the time, and there was a phenomenon of these uh, these jihadi wives, who were these European women that were marrying radicals in the Middle East and joining them on their their activities. And so she was based on a real woman that was a dangerous, dangerous Al Qaeda member whose husband had been killed. And so we wanted to explore that. And to me, she's the most interesting character. Uh, under Farrakh, Farrakh will always be the most interesting character of the villains, but she's the most interesting character of, of the cell members of two seasons because, you know, she represents, you know, what the ultimate fear of Americans is, someone like themselves. Nice, white woman that should be with them and it's not. But it, it wasn't a decision made for virtue signaling sake. You, you weren't just there, like, we want to make a woman more prominent in this season. It wasn't virtue signaling at all. The show, thank God, had no virtue signaling. I mean, we were blunt. And it's because we had this policy of finding interesting characters in the real world and basing the show on them. So there were these jihadi wives that were dangerous, dangerous people. They had, I think one had committed a suicide bombing, right? Uh, you know, and so she, it was based on real people. So we didn't need the virtue signal. We didn't like, well, it's time for the empowered female, you know, Kathleen Kennedy version of the terrorists, right? We were like, no, these people are real. It wasn't one. There were there were several of them, right? Some of these European women that were members of Al Qaeda and fighting in Iraq and all this stuff were like, wow, we got to explore this phenomenon. And, and, you know, and it was so rich to go into her psychology. And we explored it, especially because we gave her a relationship with Darwin's uh, girlfriend, Gail. And the funny thing is, Gail in that in that season is thinking, you know, I'm a Darwin. Should I convert to Islam? And she's getting all this like convert to Islam stuff from this white woman who ultimately kills her, right? And so it was it was a really fascinating exploration of the dynamic of these two women. Yeah, and that was another reason why I didn't like Mina is because she killed Gail. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of which, so like killing off regular and even well liked characters, like that's a tricky thing. Like is the, there is such a thing where like yeah. if you kill off a fan favorite character, they will just stop watching your show or reading your book or whatever. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was how, how do you determine who should be killed off in your shows and why? Like the, 
like when I think about the deaths that you guys pulled off in season two, so like probably the most horrific one was um, Elijah's killing of Carly. Like yeah, that's out. the one that stays with you, yeah. Yeah, like he, he just basically like like chokes her to death, this, this woman who's done nothing but help and support him. And the entire time he, he's just like, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And he's like killing her. And like, you, you know, I think the first time I saw that, that scene, I was like, this show's fucked up. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, this world is fucked up, and the world is fucked up. These people are fucked up. Yeah, we gotta explore it. Yeah, and and, and it just shows like like how much, how crazy the character of Elijah was. Where you know, and then he goes and and the the guy who's giving him his papers like, oh oh, good news, you, you can now stay in Canada. Yeah, you can hang out for another year, or whatever. It's just like, so I didn't have to kill my girlfriend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then he starts freaking out on that guy, right? <laughs> Yeah, and, and I don't even think that guy was, was like, "Oh yeah, kill your girlfriend." That's what I well, mean. By that was, he felt he to, you know, he said, "Well, you told me to, to tie loose ends, right?" He interpreted it that way. Yeah, and uh, the most tragic definitely was Gail's death, where you know she's, you know, being being murdered by Mina basically, and uh, she dies on the side of the road. And her last attempt is to call the police to try to warn about the terror attack, yeah. and she ends up failing. And so yeah. tragic. Um, and the most shocking was sex nurse. Uh, I mean, I mean, like you guys killed off a lot of women <laughs> in this well, season. I mean, well, you know, and, and it's it, it was it was not there was no intention of the misogyny, you know, of, of yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it was just these were the characters we wanted to explore. We had set up these characters. We wanted to take season two into a very dark Empire Strikes Back place, right? And uh, and these were the characters that were available to us to to guide on that journey and. You know, and it is it is difficult. Someone like Gail and Melissa Sage is a wonderful actress, and she was very professional. And you know, it's never pleasant to have that conversation. Like, okay, we worked together for two years, and now we're going to kill your character, right? I'm sure she may have thought we she had a few more years to go. Um, but it was the decision of this is how far we want to take this da Darwin's fall down into you know into the pit, so that we can redeem him in season three. That never happened. Well, you know, it, it's funny because it almost felt like. Like a character like Gail, who's kind of like just like the the girlfriend character, yeah. like she's not really kind of integral to the story. And in season two, it almost felt like you were uh, the writers were trying to figure out what to do with her, you know, to make her interesting, to make the yeah. audience like care about her, to make her part of the story. And uh, it, it almost felt like she was killed off because you guys just didn't know where to take her character. But at the same time, her death is really the catalyst that gets um, Darwin to go after Farik. Yeah, uh, like uh, and yeah, and I, I, I mean, again, I, I wouldn't say that we didn't know how to. I mean, if we wanted to, we would have given them a relationship with season three. Uh, I think it really was the issue of making it the catalyst, and also because we wanted a parallel because we meet we meet Farik's uh, wife, and ultimately Darwin's responsible for her death, right? And so, uh, you know, that's his his really that's his fall to darkness, and he ultimately is responsible for this other woman's death to, to balance out. Uh, you know. You know, it's uh, it, it's interesting. I had to put the lines in his mouth where, and it's a, it's, you know, where the character essentially does an eye, where Darwin basically says to him, "An eye for an eye," right? Uh, you know, you killed my girl, I killed your girl, and that's his fall into darkness, right? Which we've been trying to hold back for so long, and the dam had broken. Yeah, and it is interesting because the entire like bulk of the show, Darwin has this very kind of staunch moral code, and and yeah. he he stays true to his ideals, but then like when Gale dies. That's the thing that kind of breaks him. That that where he starts deviating from that code, and which is what we show is a the idea being there's an implication there. Of, you know, this is how a lot of these people ended up. They they thought they were good people, and certain events broke them, and then they start doing things they would never have thought they would have done before. And but in Darwin, in Darwin's case, he, he's like, I fully plan on dying in order to get my revenge. Like he becomes a revenge. He becomes a suicide bomber. See, that's that's the idea of. How again? This is not to justify these people. I certainly think you know, you know. I think if you know the politics of the guys who created the show, they're not sympathetic to these people, right? But it was to show the human thing of this character that we've cared about for two seasons, finally becoming or on the edge of becoming the monster he's fought. Which is, you know, it's it's the old. It goes back to Spider Man, right? You know, mm -hmm. you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. That's Batman. Well, it's Batman, whatever. It's Spider Man. Batman's great responsibility. You love Spider Man. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. Whatever. It's fine. Whatever. Yeah. So, speaking of the bad guys, um, it was interesting to see how Farik's character was handled in the first half of the season. You kind of talked about it earlier. Uh, but what, what made it so fascinating was like, so he's a captive, right? He, he's in, he's a prisoner of the Americans, but he's actually able to fight back against his captors quite effectively while being a prisoner. 
And it just goes to showcase the kind of threat that he poses as the series' main antagonist, where he, like, from his cell, he's able to strike yeah, against. He Hannibal Lecter. We use that term a lot. He's Hannibal Lecter, right? And he's yeah. just, them. He's guiding them, though. You know, he's showing his Machiavellian genius is he can't physically do anything, but he can give them information that's partially correct that leads them to disaster. So how were you guys able to come up with believable ways for Furrick to turn the tables on this captor so that his threat as a villain could be maintained? Well, it's it's all about we need to make it look like they've given him a real way out. Like if you cooperated with us, you might be able to see your family. You might be able to have this, right? And so you're thinking, you know, this guy ultimately, you know, he's a survivor. So he's going to do what he needs to to survive. But then, you know, he actually you discover he he's okay. You know, there's when he basically there's a there's a scene where he's giving them information, which ultimately leads them all into a trap and gets all of their, their people killed, right? And so you're like, wow. This guy is that fanatical. He knows that it's gonna when this happens, it's gonna lead to bad, bad things, which it does. It leads to him being sent to Saudi Arabia to be tortured, right? You know, he knows something like that's coming. That's how committed he is to the cause. But you believe, because of the situation he's in, that a normal human being, a criminal, would take up this offer to try to work out a way to make their life better. And but he's not a normal human being. And, and it is interesting because, like, he has these conversations with one of his yeah. interrogators. Uh, I think the guy's name is Bob. He's never really given a name. Yeah, yeah. He's just kind of a guy who's sitting there. And he's just doodling as as yeah. Furrick's being interrogated. And they have the, these little conversations that kind of challenge Farik's, you know, philosophies. Sure. And uh, I thought one of the most powerful things that uh, I ever saw Farik do was there, there was a moment where he's confronting Bob, like I, I think it might've been when uh, when they were escaping, but it might've been before that, I can't quite remember when, but he, Bob had told him a story about how when he was a kid, he fell through the ice while ice skating. Right, right, and, and then and he, he was, and he died, and he, there was nothing beyond, there was no lack of life. Yeah, he was like dead for like 20 minutes, and he came back and, and he basically said like, you're doing all this for nothing, you know, there is nothing there. And um, Farik, uh, like one of the final things he says to him is like, you know, when God tested your faith, you failed. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I will not allow myself to, to make that mistake. And it, it just showed just like how powerfully like he believed, believed with conviction in, in like, you, you know, his, his messed up kind of like fundamentalism yeah. um, that, you know, like he, he, even when confronted with this like perfectly reasonable, rational ideology, like he was just like he was not going to take the bait for that. Well, and, and and if there was a little thing that that I think I wrote the line for, which was at the, uh, which was when you know he's broken out by the Saudi you know Saudi extremists break him out of this prison in Saudi Arabia where he's been tortured, and they they kill they, they mortally wound the American interrogator, and he goes back to this dying American CIA guy who's dying and covered in blood right from this attack, and as he's dying, he looks at the guy and he says to him, he's like, now you will now you will see the truth because now you're really going to die. And now you're going to see the afterlife and you're going to be in hell or whatever the guy believes, right? And so that was how you want it. Because even to the end, he had to he had to come back to make that point. Don't try to take my belief away from me. Because that's yeah. the most offensive thing. Don't try to take my belief away from me. You're trying to tell me, you think I'm a bad person, but don't try to take my paradigm of the universe away from me. And now I'm going to come back in here when I should be running out just to say that to you. Now my paradigm is won. Now you're going to be a part of my paradigm. And that's one of the things that makes Farik such an interesting character is, is like he's just unshakable in yeah. his beliefs. And, and and that makes him so formidable because like he never wavers from that, except in that one scene that you talked about earlier where they've been torturing them and Farik finally breaks. Yeah. And it was such a great performance by Odin Fairlight. Like you see him like just kind of deflate and weep. Yeah. And he knows that that he's been broken. Yeah, he's gonna talk. Yeah. Yeah. And and he's he's gonna spill the beans and he just can't take it anymore. He's reached his breaking point. Mm -hmm. And and this is another great example of a, of a reversal where as an audience member, I'm sitting there, I'm watching that scene and o Oded is just killing it. You know, you know, like it's just it's it's painful to watch this character who, you know, was unbreakable finally break. And just as he's about to spill the beans. Uh, you guys have this army kind of break in. Yeah, there's an explosion. The wall blows up just yeah. as he's about to speak. Right? Now, now, normally, I'd, I'd say like that was a little Deus Ex Machina ish, but for some reason, it worked. Like, like it, it, just... it worked because it goes back to this thing of the reversal. We had to take it to the end. We had to get him. We had to actually break. This was a point that Ethan Reef said right in the room. He said, 
everyone breaks. The idea that somebody survives torture, that's not true. Everyone has a breaking point. Everyone eventually talks. And it's unrealistic for us to portray him as this superhuman being that's not going to break under these horrific things that are being done. Of course he's going to break. So we took it all the way to the point of he's breaking and boom, that's the reversal. It has to be that way. And, and you know, in a way, it actually strengthens the character because he's so ashamed of the fact that he broke that now that he's like back out in the game, he, he's like, I'm never going to allow myself to be in that position again. And in yeah, fact, also informs how he mistreats his daughter because he's, I mean, who knows if the person that he had been before torture would have done that to his daughter? I don't know. Or, or, or like those school, like that school that they were being built where the, he basically steals all their money, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like he probably would have, but he almost like has to double down on how yeah. on how radical he is to make up for for breaking in that moment, and that makes him an even bigger threat going into the later half of the season. Sure. Um, so, uh, what I really want to know, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, yeah. What if any plans for the third season were there? Like, I'd like to know how you guys had planned to end this this three season arc uh, if you had been given another season by Showtime. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think I, I hinted at what is stated. From my knowledge, it, we, Darwin would have come in as the handler. You know, I think there's events. Well, how, would, how would he have survived the end of, of the second well, season? Well, I mean, he, was, uh, he wasn't dead. He was shot. I think he was injured, right? But he wasn't dead and he would have recovered from that. And I think his, the problem is he can no longer play this role. His cover has been blown. You know, Farik knows who he is. That's already spreading through the Al Qaeda network. This guy is not who he claims to be, right? And so he's done. He can no longer play the role of that undercover agent, but he can play the role of a, of a mentor to someone else. And so that would have, that would have been the natural direction to go uh, from there, considering that he no longer had. You know, it's like what do you do when Peter Parker's mask comes off? Right? What do you do? Right? You know, now what do you do? Everyone knows. Uh, everyone knows who Spider Man is Peter Parker, right? So you got to take it to the next level, and that's the next level that we had planned. Uh, I know that we we had conversations about about bringing in a young hotshot, and I think we'd have gone there. And ultimately, I think it would have been, you know, because he failed. Darwin failed in season two, both in the in the terms of the practical things of stopping the terror attack, and also failed morally as a person. I mean, he became somebody he didn't want to be, right? And so I think season three, the journey would have been to bring him back from that edge and to find a way to regain his humanity and to make up for the person that he had become. Uh, I think I certainly as a writer would have liked to have explored that. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, we never had a chance to. Well, would, would Farik have had a showdown with, with him in the third well, season? I think that ultimately after it's like Darth Vader and Skywalker, you got to have, you know, they, he chops off the hand, you know, at the end of season two, you got to have the final redemption. I mean, and I, I don't think Farik would have been redeemed, but I think we would have tried to make because we were always having fun with his character, who knows what Ethan and Cyrus would have chosen to do to give him his his swan song, you know, to even that even though when when however he was going to go out, you would still love him and hate him. And I'm sure they had ideas for that that I didn't know of. Well, it's a shame you never got that third season because I would have liked to have seen how everything wrapped up. Well, you know, I hope people will still watch. You know, the show, as you know, the show's available on Amazon for you can buy DVDs, it's streaming and all that. It's still available. And, you know, I actually, the delightful thing is I still get resi residual checks, substantial residual checks from streaming. So people are still downloading the show. Please keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cameron, thank you so much. Is there any final advice you'd want to give people about how to properly write a political thriller like uh, Sleeper Cell? Yeah, the most important thing is get your politics out of it, you know. You can have a character express your politics, but make sure that everyone else's politics are authentic, especially in the time frame that we're living in where everything is political correctness and virtue signaling and the other side has nothing righteous about what they're saying. That's bad storytelling. You have to go in and you have to present the other person, your adversary's point of view with as much or even more authenticity than your own, uh, which is what I try to do in all of my work. You know, you you can still hate the other person's point of view, but you've got to understand why they believe it. You can't just say, this person voted for Trump because they're a racist. You have to understand what aspects of Trump's message worked for them and what aspects of, of Clinton didn't work or, you know, or Biden today, right? And you have to be honest about that even if it makes you uncomfortable, right? And so that's what you have to do in political storytelling, political thrillers, is that you have to be honest. And where can people find your books and follow you on Twitter and all that good stuff? So, you know, you can see my name on the screen, Cameron Pasha. If you go to CameronPasha.com, that's my website. Uh, you know, you can order my books directly from there. And it clicks to Amazon. Just click the images of the book, and it'll take you to Amazon. You can buy them from there. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter, which is, again, my name, uh, you know, at Cameron Pasha. 
uh, at, at Twitter. And uh, I, you know, I've got a lot of views. I, you know, hope you'll tolerate some of them. I'm pretty straightforward about my political and my religious views. Uh, they're not easy to define, so it's not like this guy's a Republican or a Democrat or, or this or that. You know, but I like to share my point of view, which, as, as you know, Matt, is not always easy in Hollywood. I've already accepted. I've been 19 years of this journey. I've made a lot of enemies. I have people that won't hire me because they don't like who I am or they don't like what I stand for. And that's already solidified. So at this point, I'm just like, you know, a lot of my friends hide their true selves online because they're afraid they might offend a potential employer. I'm, I'm past that. The employers all know who I am and they've already, some of them decided, yeah, it's not for me. So I'm, I'm as honest as possible and you'll see the truth of who I am uh, on my social media. Well, Cameron, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to talk about Sleeper Cell. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to talk about Kings. I would really love to dive into that. And uh, Nikita as well, uh, which was another favorite show of mine. Um, but uh, thank you so much. And to everyone out there watching, this is Matthew Kadish, and I will catch you later. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out the video. Please check us out on our socials. You can find us on Facebook at eggfbgroup.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Matthew Kadish. K-A-D-I-S-H. You can find us on Instagram at Matthew Kadish as well. You can also find us on Patreon. Support us by going to www.kadishdonate.com and subscribe to us on YouTube at kadishvideo.com. We update our channel regularly. Finally, check us out on Amazon at kadishbooks.com. K-A-D-I-S-H books.com. Thank you all for tuning in. This is Matthew Kadish, and I will catch you later.